There will now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Thank you. You may be seated. Order, members, order. <laughs> Honorable members, uh, before we proceed with today's business, I wish to make the following announcement. That the vacancy which occurred in the National Assembly due to the passing on of Mr. TZM Koza has been filled by the nomination of Ms. A.T. Mfulo with effect from the 1st of September 2017. And that the vacancy which occurred in the National Assembly owing to the resignation of Dr. W.G. James has been filled by the nomination of Mr. R.T. Hugo with effect from the 4th of September. <laughs> the members have taken the oath of affirmation in the Deputy Speaker's for, uh, office. Uh, welcome once more members to the National Assembly. The first item on the order paper is questions addressed to the Deputy President. Members may press the talk button on their desk if they wish to ask supplementary question. The first question has been asked by the Honorable J.L. Farbs, the Honorable the Deputy President. Deputy Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member. Deputy Speaker, at the last sitting where you were present, um, you indicated that you would be returning to this house for the ruling on the behavior of Mr. Dix. And I wondered if you were in a position to deliver that ruling today. Yeah. No, we will let you know when we are ready to do it. Uh, we will do it, yeah. Thank you. Deputy President. Deputy Speaker. Thank you for this opportunity. I thought I should do something unprecedented and uh, start off by addressing a matter which has uh, embroiled me in pers matters that affect my personal life. And I thought Because I work with all of you, right across party lines, in many ways all of you are my colleagues, and just say that I will be addressing this matter in a day or two. Uh, this one does because I do need to take responsibility and be accountable. Indeed, not to this house, but I just wanted to say it. So <clears throat> I had a sense that because we are all colleagues, much as this matter is a personal one, I should make this type of statement. And thank you very much, Mr. President, <laughs> Deputy Speaker. Um, Honorable Deputy President, uh, oh, you still, sorry. I, I, I want to proceed answering questions. Yesterday we received rather positive news that South Africa is out of a technical recession. We have seen how multilateral organizations like the IMF, the World Bank and the G20 and indeed many others that are part of the OECD stable have been seeking to find answers for reforms in order to reverse global lack of growth and inequality. Many countries are having to deal with uh, their own challenges of growth. Therefore, the news from our own statistician that our GDP had risen to 2.5 in the quarter was very encouraging indeed. 
But this is not the time to celebrate yet, for the task before us, Deputy Speaker, remains huge. We are far behind our NDP target of 5% growth per annum. The triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and inequality remains. Our young people continue to be on, at the epicenter of the unemployment challenge. And uh, poverty, as we have all heard, continues to rise. Like several sectors of the economy, mining still remains a priority sector. We believe that the sector retains great potential to create jobs and to contribute to our national wealth. The plan that is in place for mining is beginning to bear fruit. Mining production increased to 4.6% year on year in February this year. Statistics South Africa recently reported that compared to previous years, job losses in the mining sector had slowed down substantially in the last quarter of 2016. 2017 employment numbers show that the mining sector is thus far making a positive contribution. As a demonstration of working together, government convened mining industry stakeholders in 2015 in a collaborative operation, Pakisa, which in itself is showing positive results. To substantially raise unemployment, or employment rather, we need to have more inclusive growth we need to change also the structure of our economy and demonstrate that if we have startups and new entrants in our economy, we should be able to stimulate greater competition and therefore growth. We need more regional trade and better integration into global value chains. We need to work with all social partners to rebuild confidence and to stabilize our state-owned enterprises. These expectations are matched by our daily actions to reignite growth, such as we are doing in Invest South Africa, reducing red tape and the costs associated with starting new businesses is beginning to work. In unlocking our ocean's economy, Ocean uh, Operation Pakisa has Deputy Speaker, unlocked investments estimated at 24.6 billion, with government contributing 15 billion to this. The Department of Trade and Industry is currently providing incentive support to the tune of 428 million for investment in ports, marine manufacturing, including boat building, aquaculture, and this has led to the creation of almost 7,000 jobs. We're working on several fronts, Deputy Speaker, to build confidence and productivity in our economy. In pursuit of stability, peace, and fairness in the workplace, we've been working with social partners to reduce the risks of prolonged and violent strikes. And this has borne fruit. The principles of the min national minimum wage have been agreed, and we should be in time to introduce the national minimum wage on the 1st of May 2018. Through a collaborative effort, government and business have agreed to set up the youth service, employment service, which will bring in up to one million young people into work opportunities where they'll be able to gain skills and be in internships. Now, these are just some of the highlights, Deputy Speaker, that shows that what, when government and social partners work together, they are able to improve the employment, the investment climate, and create work opportunities for our people. We are fully aware that GDP growth is not enough unless the economy creates sustainable jobs, and closes the inequality gap. It is important for all of us to focus on the positives. Our potential, Deputy Speaker, remains 
greater than our current difficulties, and it is up to all of us as South Africans to ensure that we stay the course of growth and development. It is upon all of us to demonstrate that we can infuse hope and opportunity within the South African marketplace, which will be to the benefit of our nation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, please allow me to interrupt the Deputy President and the next, uh, in order to welcome a delegation from the Republic of Gambia, led by the Honorable Attorney General and the Minister of Justice, uh, is in South Africa for a week-long study tour on the South African Truth and Reconciliation. Welcome uh, to our parliament, honorable members. Thank you. Honorable Fabs. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Deputy President, for your response there. It was very comprehensive. There are just one or two issues which I would like clarified. You have emphasized the need for a broad overarching partnership with all sectors of society to effect more jobs, to actually implement, among other things, the mining plan, which also looked at stemming the retrenchment, creating new jobs, but perhaps most of all, your reference to the minimum wage, which has taken two years since the president mooted it in 2014. But perhaps the most important thing, Deputy President, as we've seen from the technical recession being overcome, is that you have managed to develop a platform on which all sectors of society can work together and overcome labor instability and what I would call investor strikes. My question then is this, in what, what measures do you think or are you considering at the moment to escalate, to accelerate the creation of employment? Not only among the youth, which is a huge section of the population, but also among those 40 and 50 year olds who were retrenched due to lack of strategic skills. Can you please share with us how or what measures you are considering at the moment in government? I thank you. Deputy President. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And clearly, <clears throat> the issue of unemployment is much more overarching and it does not only affect young people, it also affects older people who have been displaced out of their jobs through the lack of economic growth and companies running into difficulties. Now, we are already beginning to see green shoots, green shoots in a number of sectors of our economy. If you look at what drove the current, the last quarter growth to 2.5%, you will see that Mining was one of those, agriculture was one of those, and a number of other sectors also contributed. Government was on the negative, and trade was slightly on the negative as well, which demonstrates that various sectors in our economy can indeed generate growth, and that's where our focus should be. Energy also demonstrated that it can generate growth. Now, agriculture was a very pleasant surprise, but not so much a surprise because in our, one, in our nine point plan, <laughs> we, did, we did identify agriculture as a growth driver. And indeed, in the national development plan, we have projected that agriculture can create up to one million jobs. And we're beginning to see the green shoots in as far as agriculture on its own is concerned. The productivity increase in the mining sector also has shown that when people get focused on increasing productivity, uh, we can see genuine growth. Now, what does genuine growth finally lead to? It leads to creation of jobs. 
We're seeing it in agriculture already, and we're seeing it in other sectors of our economy, and that, in a number of ways, is precisely what we want to see. But the overarching, the overarching process that we have put in place is the way in which we have crafted this structure where government, business, labor, and community are able to get together to address the challenges that face our economy. As it is now, they have been busy looking at issues such as the downgrading, a structure was created, the issue of looking at labor stability has yielded good results, and the issue of investment, encouragement, and confidence building is also another. So we've built a number of structures and institutions that are, have the ability to address all these challenges that our country faces. And as I said when I ended the answer to my, uh, my initial question, it is when we work together, when all sectors or stakeholders in South Africa work together, that we are able to address the problems. We are seeing precisely the benefit of working together, and I have no doubt in my mind that if we continue along this path, we'll see even the next quarters and the next quarter uh, GDP growth figures going upwards. And thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Mateis, EFF. Honorable Mateis uh, of the EFF. Honorable members. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy President, job loss is the crisis of over-accumulation and capitalist contradiction we talk about. We all know that the capitalists cannot exploit other capitalists, but can only exploit workers. Pick and pay is removing tellers to install machines. Marula Platinum and Twickenham Platinum Mines retrenched workers and immediately put machines. This is happening in all other sectors, including in manufacturing and agriculture. This is not recent, but a long trend of capitalist system in perpetual crisis. In this anticipated, in this anticipated Honourable environment, member, what's your conducive, question? Your time has expired. In this anticipated what's your environment, question, Honourable Member? Here is my question. Listen to me. Honourable Member, your time has expired. Environment, conducive your time has expired. We switch off your mic. With the with with increased job creation, how do you intend? But I'm still. Honorable member, no, your time has expired. Your time has expired. I'm no, sorry. Deputy, deputy no. speaker. No, your time has you expired. Must be consistent. Honorable member, yes. No, the you must the be time consistent. allocated to supplementary questions is known but to each one of you. Why are you so harsh? No, why no. Are you so harsh? No, no. There is no additional why are you provision. So harsh? No, honorable member. You're, you are one minute over your time. This can't be harsh. It must be applicable to all members. No, here. take your seat on Not a member. On my side only. You must um, do the same Deputy also President, on this side. Would you like to comment? No, this honourable member, take your seat, please. Yeah, but the Deputy President has said me. He no, will no, no, no. Honourable member, no, please. No, the Deputy President has said the question. He will honourable, take your seat, honourable member, please. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. Go ahead, honourable President. Comment. Deputy President, thank you. On, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker, the, indeed the issue of job losses that are given rise to by technological advances where machines replace workers is a matter of concern to all of us. And this is an old age problem. We saw it as industrialization started uh, uh, speeding up and in a number of sectors in our economy, we've seen how workers have lost jobs to machines or to new processes that are put in place. 
the challenge that all of us have, and particularly now as we face the fourth industrial revolution, is that indeed we are going to find robots replacing workers, and this is a global problem. We have to be ahead of the curve. We have, as a developing economy, to find ways in which we can keep our people in jobs. And we've got to create the type of jobs that are smart, jobs that will not easily be replaced by machines, but if that happens, we should be able to ensure that our workers, our workers are so well trained and so well prepared that we will be able to absorb this storm that is coming because it is going to come and the fourth industrial revolution is, is going to be driven by machines and, uh, and new technologies. So the challenge for us is, are we prepared for that? And I would say it is also up to this house, these clever minds that are here to come up with ideas on how we can ensure that we do not get our people to lose jobs as the fourth industrial revolution takes root also in our economy. Thank you. Honorable Kata. Uh, thank you. The unemployment rate has been rising yearly for the uh, past point nine of order. years. Point of order. What's your point of order, honorable member? No, I don't have a problem. Is that uh, the, the deputy speaker? You oh, the honorable members, please order. Uh, have, to no, honorable members, I am chairing this session. Go ahead, honorable Chauke. Honorable Chauke, uh, stop smiling and talk. <laughs> deputy speaker, you have called for honorable Kata. Now, I don't know since when Honorable Kata has beard and is now changed to look like Madisha. Okay, Honorable Member, okay, leave that to the chair. Honorable Madisha, please proceed. Honorable Members, please be in order. Thank you very much. I indicated already, Mr. Deputy President, that the unemployment rate has been rising yearly for the past uh, nine years. Now, Mr. Deputy President, neither the President's nine-point plan nor the Minister of Finance's 14-point plan appear to provide a real solution for tangible and meaningful economic uh, growth. What is required is fundamental structural reforms and uh, confidence in the country's leadership. But the executive appears unwilling or unable to take decisive, brave, and coherent action, or Honorable be Member, I'm afraid your time has expired. Honorable members, honorable members, the time allocation is between your whips. I've got nothing to do with it. I only enforce it. So please, if you spend your time on comment and not going to a question, there's nothing I can do. Uh, you already have more than 30 seconds, sir. I can't give you any more. Let the president, deputy president comment or respond to what you have already said. Thank you very much. Order, speaker. What's your point of order, sir? Speaker, it's for the second time. Um, you refer to a deputy president as president. Don't bring your functional battles here in Palermo. Oh. He's a deputy president, not okay. the president. You said it first time, you're saying it for the second time. Please, man, deputy president, rise. Honorable member, thank you very much for your wise advice. Honorable members, uh, please be mindful of time allocation. I do want to repeat it. Uh, that uh, I was not uh, given a, a, an additional discretion to add a lot of time on your time. Room is very small. Honorable Deputy President, please go ahead. The little bit that I have. Uh, honorable members, you are now out of order. Absolutely out of order, and you must not bring disruption to our house. Just keep quiet, please. There's order here. Go ahead, Deputy President. The little bit that I heard before the question was posed seems to be leading to 
one of the problems with uh, the, 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 the levels of unemployment or what causes it is the structure of our economy. I think I heard that. Uh, and if that is the case, I would agree that yes, the structure of our economy uh, does in a number of ways also gives ri give rise to the levels of uh, unemployment, our inability to create the greater number of jobs uh, that the country should have. And it is when we go to the root of these real systemic challenges and problems that we will be able to resolve the structure of our economy and therefore unlock growth. I have no doubt in my mind that if we were to do that, and already we are focusing on how we can restructure our economy and go to the root, that way we will be able to open up a number of opportunities that will lead to greater job creation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Lorima. Last one. You can't hope to save mining jobs unless the mining industry has confidence in this government and its policies. Now we know the industry does not have confidence in this government because it's taking your government to court over Mining Charter 3. So Deputy President, do you acknowledge that Mining Charter 3 is a barrier to the restoration of confidence? And if you do, why don't you scrap it? Honourable Deputy President. The Mining Charter was released uh, to, to the industry and what, has now, what is now ensuing is that there are discussions that are taking place between the mining industry and government and labor and indeed other players. I've often said that let us allow that process to carry on. And that is a process through which the role players in the industry will be able to resolve the problems that beset the industry right now. now the 10-point mining plan that was released. No, 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 no. The 10-point mining plan that was released seeks to address some of these challenges. And the addressing the mining charter is also going to allow the stakeholders to be able to talk to each other. I was one of those who said, I want us to encourage a collaboration and a dialogue between all stakeholders in the mining industry. And I said that advisedly because I saw what dialogue yields when we were able to sit down to discuss issues of stabi labor stability in the broader economy. So you may not have faith and confidence in people sitting around a table and having a dialogue, but some of us do because we have seen the results of what dialogue can do. And so it is, going, it is now underway, and it's no use crying over spilt milk. We now need to focus on the dialogue that is now going to happen. And that dialogue is the one that you should focus on and have confidence that it will yield good results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, we go to question 32, asked by Honorable DJ Menir. Deputy President. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I, as I said in this House two weeks ago, in 2015, President Zuma announced the reprioritization of government interventions to support To, <laughs> to support economic growth. <laughs> yes, indeed, you guessed right through the nine-point plan. In 2017, Deputy Speaker, our implementation of the nine-point plan continues, and it continues to create a better life and, indeed, a better economy for our country. And I'll tell you how it is doing so. In the course of revitalizing the agriculture and agro-processing value chain, we have seen net exports of agricultural raw products. We have seen them increasing from an average, on average by 14.6% since 2012. 23 agri-parks, Honorable Deputy Speaker, are currently being developed 
and will be completed by 2019. Through the implementation of the Industrial Policy Action Plan, four industrial parks have been launched in South Africa. We continue to see expansion in the auto sectors of our economy, with auto making companies investing billions and billions of rand. In May of this year, Beijing Auto Works, together with the IDC, launched the expansion of the new era facility in Springs in Gauteng. The investment into this expansion is estimated at 250 million rand and will create 100 new jobs. The MAN plant in Olifant's Fontaine in Gauteng is now producing buses for our Tswane BRT uh, service with 80% local content. The first auto works in, of China invested 600 million in a truck assembly facility at Kuha uh, in the Eastern Cape. The clothing and textile industry turn, turn around has resulted in 70,000 jobs being saved with an estimated 9,550 jobs created and 28 new companies that were established. The Black Industrialist Program has supported 46 projects that have attracted 3.7 billion rand of private sector investment, and this has created almost 20,000 jobs. To support localization, Deputy Speaker, 21 products and sectors have been designated for local production. This includes products such as bus bodies, clothing, textile, leather, footwear, school furniture, office furniture, steel power pylons, and canned or processed vegetables. Our interventions, Deputy Speaker, to support investment and growth through the Nine Point Plan includes unlocking the potential of SMMEs, co-ops, and rural and township enterprises by implementing the 30% set-aside policy that was adopted by this government. The one-stop shop launched in 2016 is now fully operational. You can go and visit. President Zuma will, on the, 6th, on the 8th of September, this Friday, he will launch the first Invest South Africa one-stop shop here in Cape Town. This facility, Deputy Speaker, aims to provide strategic guidance, reduce regulatory inefficiencies, and reduce red tape for all investors looking to invest in the Western Cape. Now, these are some of the problems that a number of members raised here. And this is a clear demonstration that we have heard you and we've also heard our people and the investing community, and these problems are now being resolved. And you can go and join President Zuma when he opens that facility and see how best it's going to work. This initiative aims to improve the business environment for investment in the local economy. Our work at NEDLAC in reducing workplace conflict has resulted in the agreement that I always talk about here. And we are constantly, Deputy Speaker, planting seeds of future growth. And we are extremely encouraged by the green shoots that we steadily see in various sectors of our economy. Our greatest investment, Deputy Speaker, is not cash. Our greatest investment is confidence. We are seeking to engender confidence in this country and in this economy. And this is what this government is busy with on a daily basis. And if we can remain focused on the progress we are making daily in our economy, this will give us the inspiration to create the South Africa that all of us desire. And the key issue is that we must remain focused and have confidence in our own country. Thank you very much. Honorable Menir.
Deputy Speaker, on a lighter note, uh, this is an ideal opportunity for the Deputy President to demonstrate his fitness for higher office and name the nine points in the nine point plan without looking at his notes. I'll speak on a more serious note. The Deputy President tells us that the nine point plan is having a positive effect on the economy. But just two weeks ago, the Minister in the Presidency, Jeff Redebe, told us, uh, and I quote, the nine point plan has not yet resulted in an improved impact on the economy. So could the President tell us why, when it comes to the nine-point plan, he, at least as far as the Minister uh, goes, uh, has no idea what he's talking about? Or alternatively, is he suggesting that the Minister, when it comes to the nine-point plan, has no idea what he is talking about? Perhaps, uh, Deputy Speaker, a time out so that the Deputy President can confer with his colleagues and this cabinet can get their story straight on the nine-point plan. <laughs> Deputy President, no need to get our story right. Now, the nine-point the, the nine plan, no, listen, the nine-point plan, like any other plan we craft, is a long-term plan. It's long-term and let me tell you what the nine-point plan... No, no, listen first. You listen now. The nine-point plan contained nine elements. The first one... No, no, listen. The first one was to resolve the energy challenges that our country was going through. Tick. Tick that one. Tick that box, honorable member. That has worked extremely well. The energy challenges that the country faces are behind us now. Now, the GDP figures that have just come out have demonstrated that the nine-point plan is working. The agri contribution to our GDP growth, a 2.5 GDP growth during this past quarter is something that we had not foreseen. We had not foreseen it. Even your own economists could not have foreseen that agriculture will make such a great contribution. It is part of the nine-point plan, my friend, because the nine-point plan addressed the challenge that we face in agriculture. Now, you look at, you look at the contribution that energy, energy has, has, has done in terms of driving the growth. It has driven great energy uh, growth for our 2.5% rise. The Ocean Pakisa, which, as I said in my opening address, in my answer, has already attracted 46 billion rand. Already, we are building boats. We are building tugboats. Tugboats that we are taking and exporting out of the country. We are doing precisely that. Whether you like it or not, it is happening in this very economy. And the issue of localization is taking root. The buses that are now being used in our major metros are being manufactured here, and 80% of the content is local content. Now, this is how the nine-point plan is moving this country forward. Mining is also a critical sector in our economy. Just, no, 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 no. The minister, the minister in the presidency had not foreseen, had not foreseen that mining would have made such a great contribution. So he made the, he made the statement earlier. He made the statement earlier, and now, because we have a very scientific approach to the way we do things, the statistician general, who is independent, by the way, said, good news and good news, good news to you all. We have grown by 2.5%, and these are the key drivers to the growth that we have achieved. So I'd like you to go and take the nine-point plan and take it for bedtime reading. Study it very carefully. 
and see how it is driving this economy forward. Thank you very much. Honorable Sengwa. So, so, uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member. Thank you so much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, may I address you on rule number 66? The member has asked the question. The Deputy President is trying to answer the questions, but he gets interrupted by the members of the DA. May I am requesting you that to address number, rule number 66. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Order, Honorable Members. Order. Order, Honorable Members. Okay. Honorable Members, you heard the member. Honorable members, please, Honorable Tlengwa, proceed. Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Um, Honorable Acting Mr. President, uh, since the President is away, it's all good and well what we received yesterday, um, the 2.5 uh, growth. But if you recall, in 2005, we also celebrated about 5.5 growth as a country, but it was jobless growth. The same now has happened, and youth unemployment in particular is what I would like to zoom on, Mr. Acting President, that the youth unemployment now stands at 55.9% and continues to increase. So whilst you speak about the nine-point plan, I would like to find out what are the targeted areas in the nine-point plan which deal specifically um, with ensuring that youth unemployment is um, addressed particularly along the lines of innovation, skills development, knowledge and expertise, and whether business incubation is taking center stage as we try and give um, SMMEs a priority in the economy. Honorable Member, so if we your can time sharpen is expired. youth unemployment within the parameters of the Honorable Plan, Senga, thank you, Deputy Speaker. time is expired. Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, we are focusing a number of interventions to address the issue of youth unemployment. The first and key one that we decided to focus on is a collaboration between business and government and labor where we are setting up the youth employment service. And as I said, through that, we are going to create, at the very least, 330,000 jobs a year over the next three years. And that is a million jobs where young people are going to be brought into internships, they'll be brought into learnerships, and our experience is up to 60 to 70 percent of young people who get into learnerships do finally get absorbed into the labor market. So we are hoping and staking quite a lot of hope uh, in this process working well. The agro-processing process or initiative that we've embarked upon in terms of the nine-point plan is going also to focus on how we bring young people into agriculture, how we are going to equip them with skills, and how we are going to attract them to become employed in agriculture, but to start off with agricultural studies. Now, we are seeing something very interesting at the university level and at Tibet colleges level. A number of young people are taking up agricultural studies. And when it comes to the issue you mentioned, which is uh, uh, business incubation, a huge industry <coughs> is growing around incubation. And we have found that the incubation of startups, small and medium enterprises, does actually yield a lot of benefits. And many young people are being drawn into that. And in some universities, initiatives have actually been started where young people who are innovative, who are clever, who've got new ideas are being brought into incubation processes so that they can uh, showcase their ability to deal with new technologies and a whole number of new uh, uh, developments. Now, these are incubation processes that lead to the establishment of businesses, uh, getting people to be properly mentored, and starting small and medium enterprises that immediately have a market in one way or another. And the many other things that we are doing in terms of this plan are targeting young people, because we have decided that 
We want to focus on bringing young people into the world of work so that we can take as many as, uh, of them as possible out of unemployment into employment. So we've got a plethora of initiatives. Even the Rural uh, Development Ministry is bringing young people into uh, an initiative where they are being trained into a whole number of uh, other skills. Our public employment program also brings in a number of young people. And this is another important one, because as they get into the public employment programs, we find that they learn skills, they become uh, accustomed to the world of work, and they are then able to get into the labor market with greater ease and get into new jobs. So work is underway to get young people into, job, into jobs throughout uh, the, the economy. So we are not sitting on our laurels, we are doing quite a lot of things. I could go on and on and give you a whole number of other initiatives that we are busy with. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mishwe. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. When delivering his State of the Nation address in February this year, the President lamented the fact that the economy was not growing fast enough to create much needed jobs. Among other things, he mentioned transport infrastructure as one of the cross-cutting focus areas that would be added to the nine-point plan to reignite the economy. There are companies we know that are suffering profit decline because of metro rails poor service. Some are reportedly operating at 50% capacity as a result of the erratic rail service. When trains are late, staff arrive late for work, resulting in the loss of essential working hours and consequently declining profit margins. What will government do to ensure that South Africans get an efficient and reliable train system that will ensure that our workforce reaches their place of employment safely and on time, thus ensuring profitability and a boost to our failing economy? Thank you. Deputy President. You'll be pleased to know, Honorable Mishra, On that- of uh, order, Deputy Speaker, sorry. Yes. Uh, what, future what? President. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm just concerned, uh, the Honorable Batabile um, is drinking some greenish substance, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, so um, is that allowed? I just want to check with you. Uh, Honorable Minister, we have in the past advised members not to bring any drinking stuff, as, except those that is served by the uh, service officers. Uh, honorable members, please do not do that. Okay. But you must ask her to leave with that greenish substance because we don't know what is in there. Please, you must ask her to leave with it. Uh, honorable because member. you have asked in the past the others to leave, so she must do the same. She is not no, immune no, no, to, no. to the rules no, of the house. No, no, no. Yes, take you have your, done it. Honorable member, please take your seat and stop telling me what rulings to make in future. Allow me to make the rulings, please. Deputy Speaker, please. Yes. on a point of order, Yes, I think you need to be consistent because the other day you were very harsh with me when I brought in a cool drink and you chased me out. Hon so you must give her the same treatment. Honorable, no, Honorable <laughs> Merve, Honorable, please hold on, hold on. Honorable Fall Member, you were sitting here next to your whip. You went back to your seat and you never went out. You, yes, you never went out. Honorable Member, please remember uh, no, 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 no. From the whip, you went to your seat where your drink was and you never left. That's, that's out of order. Honorable members, please uh, mind the truth. It's always useful to be accurate and so on. Even if you think it's not to your advantage, say it. It liberates you. Absolutely, even if it pisses you off. Of order, honorable, honorable, uh, members, speak. honorable minister, Deputy please do speaker, as, we, as speak. we have suggested. Deputy Speaker, on a, on a point of order, so yes. parliamentary language should always be, uh, the example should be set from the chair. Yes. I would submit that the word that you've used is unparliamentary. Which one? 
I don't want to repeat it because I don't want to be guilty of the same transgression. But it starts with a P and ends with an S. It has to do with urination. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Honorable members, that word, <laughs> no, it means it makes you angry, it makes you mad. That's what it means, not what Honorable the Chief Whip is saying. If you feel it's offensive, I will withdraw it immediately. Deputy, but it doesn't mean that. Deputy Speaker, and I'm maybe going they... to bring my dictionary to your <laughs> office, but I withdraw it. Deputy Speaker, okay. perhaps, perhaps a different cultural context. <laughs> but I think it'll it's be safer. It's not cultural context. No, 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 no. It'll no. be safer if you withdraw, sir. <laughs> uh, Honorable Deputy President, please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, honorable Deputy Speaker. Oh, oh, did you finish answering Honorable Mission? No. No, well, I'm please go about ahead. to answer Honorable yes. Mission. Yes. I was going to say, Honorable Mission, you'll be pleased to hear that I've just come out of a meeting where the issue of uh, the trains and Prasa was being discussed. A number of the concerns that you have articulated, delayed trains, trains being cancelled, trains never arriving, and people arriving late at work were issues that were discussed and raised very sharply. And in that regard, we, having discussed the matter, we, thought that we said that we will take action to address all those issues, starting off clearly with making sure that we have proper uh, structures that are going to uh, run PRASA, make sure that uh, the board is properly constituted, make sure that the management is properly streamlined and they know what they should be doing, and make sure that the trains run properly throughout the country. And we've received reports that it's not only in one area, it's the Western Cape in Gauteng and a number of places where we have such challenges. So it, problems are being addressed, and thank you very much for raising the issue. Thank you, sir. Uh, Honorable Kubisa. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Honorable Deputy President, there is no doubt that uh, uh, ocean economy plays a critical role when it comes to job creation. And you have just referred to Ocean Pakisa, which plays a cardinal role in also job creation and skills development. Now, I would like to know what strides have been taken to ensure that uh, the people within the proximity of our ports, for instance, Kuha, Deben, Richards Bay, uh, get some opportunities to have their skills developed, equipped, and our youth in particular, are they getting access uh, to job opportunities? Are they getting equipped? for them to get skills, uh, especially with regard to skills. Thank you very much. Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Kubisa, you will be pleased to know that we are taking a lot of initiatives to skill young people to get ready for the auction economy take off. Uh, I have been privileged enough as I've traveled around a number of countries to visit young people that we have sent to countries such as Sweden to go and get marine training. I met almost 25 young people who are doing master's degrees in marine training. Uh, and this, having been arranged by our Department of Higher Education, I've uh, been privileged enough to go to Japan and met young people that we are training, and some of whom are about to complete their studies. I did the same when I went to Vietnam. I met a number of these young people who come from here, who are being trained in marine training and various aspects, including boat building, by the way. Uh, and went also to Singapore, met young people who are being trained in ocean transportation, and uh, also being able to manage harbors. I also went to China, and met young people from here who are being trained uh, at their, some of their big universities 
on, o on the ocean economy. So what we have sought to do, Honorable Kubisa, is to send many of our young people to go and get trained in various skills. And these are skills that were closed to many black young people in our country. Now they are acquiring those skills. And let me say to you, they are all enthusiastic, raring to come back to contribute to the country that has enabled them to go out and learn all those skills. And we also had an opportunity as we traveled, particularly to Vietnam, to go with uh, a, a, a number of people who want to get into business, into the ocean economy business, into boat building. And they were able to see that this is a business that can yield quite a lot of profit for them. So a lot is happening in that sector that is going to yield good results for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> it deals with question 32. We now move to uh, question 33, asked by the Honorable Mende, MD Mende. Deputy President. Honorable Deputy Speaker, as I have stated in this House, on a number of occasions, members of the executive are collectively and individually accountable to parliament. And this is in terms of our constitution and also in terms of the rules of the National Assembly. The constitution further says that members of cabinet must provide parliament with full and regular reports regarding matters under their control. The executive members remain committed to ensuring that these members do account, rather I should say the executive itself remains committed to making sure that members of the executive do account regularly and effectively to parliament. As the leader of government business, I provide cabinet with regular reports on this matter. Each time cabinet meets, I table a report on the activities of the executive members in relation to their responsibility to this parliament. It is a fairly extensive report which deals with various aspects of the way in which members of the executive interface with parliament. Where difficulties arise between ministers and committees, such issues should be escalated to appropriate structures. And we know that a number of uh, committees do at times raise concerns about the manner in which they are functioning or working with members of the executive. And in this regard, we say, if such incidents do come up, there's nothing that stops members of parliament from raising these matters through appropriate structures of this National Assembly. In fact, this House has full rights and authority to sanction members. It has the right to call members to come here. It also has the right to sanction members of the executive, those who miss scheduled meetings without reasonable explanation can be sanctioned by this house. Such powers do not reside with the leader of government business. And this is so because it is this house that can also sanction the leader of government business. If, as your deputy president, I do falter in my tasks and don't account to you, you can sanction me. It is my wish that the executive and parliament will remain, will maintain the good track record we have established and that disputes will be resolved with the ultimate objective of ensuring that there is accountability, uh, first and foremost, and that this parliament functions as we want it to function. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, 
an honorable uh, mentor. It's, yeah. Yeah, Ngozi, Deputy Speaker. Deputy President, you've said a mouthful. And yet, we remain with empty chairs. Especially here in the front where your ministers are supposed to be seated. And that doesn't happen only today. It happens during member statement and motions where they are supposed to be giving answers. Secondly, on this question, I specifically asked about Minister Mutambi, and you did not go there. You are saying the committees have powers. Let me tell you something. That committee sanctioned Minister Mutambi. Guess what happened? It was withdrawn from another level. So where are these powers exactly? That was withdrawn at another level, and the chairperson of that committee was never made aware that the subpoena has been withdrawn. Aye, aye. Then thirdly, Minister Mutambi, you just hear, you did a very good thing, a very disciplined member of parliament taking accountability and responsibility of actions, in fact, allegations. She never came here to explain why she's flying her own family. She never came here to explain why she's hiring her own family in the department. She has never accounted for anything, and yet she remains a member of the cabinet. Why is that? Honorable Deputy President. Now, uh, honorable, honorable member, the, the, the matter, and I'm sorry you had a sense that I did not answer the matter of uh, Minister Mutambi. The matter of Minister Mutambi, as I understand it, is being dealt with at the committee level. Now, and that is where it should, it should be. And uh, I, I will follow it up so that the matter should be dealt with. Uh, I will follow it up because that's where it should start. And the members of the committee, as a structure of this National Assembly, should be able to deal with that matter, and they should get an explanation from the member in question. So that, I trust, should then take place, and I will be raising it as well. Thank you very much. Soon. Uh, uh, Honorable Tlawama. Order, honorable honorable uh, order. Deputy Speaker, Honorable Deputy President, I want to recommend some table, tablets to heal your fear because, <laughs> because Honorable Deputy President, you must agree with me that it's truly myth mysterious and suspicious that Minister Fit Mutambi is still a minister, where good ministers were fired. This latest shenanigans of this minister shows that you are undermined as a leader of business uh, uh, government. Can you show some courage on the, can you show some courage and recommend that this minister must be fi fired? Otherwise, Deputy President, this will contaminate you and the chances of you being the leader of this country. Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Uh, it is such an easy question to answer. The Deputy President does not appoint members of the executive. So I cannot do that. I cannot even venture into the direction that you are suggesting to suggest or recommend or not recommend it is not my task, it is not my duty, it's not my burden, and it's not my area of responsibility. I am just the deputy president, and the president is the one who appoints, who does all that. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Speaker, 
What are you raising on remember? The deputy president has responded previously. He said he's going to follow up. Can he give flesh to the follow up? Because we thought following up, including firing weights. On, honorable member, please take your seat. That's uh, honorable Kwabaza. Deputy Speaker, it's Deputy Speaker. Yes, honorable. It's honorable Kuno. Oh, are we on Kwabaza? Go ahead. Okay. And Siabulala, Sekela Mongameli, Yendle Lopendule Umbuzo Nakona. As parliamentarians, we are accountable to the public by ensuring fulfillment of their needs through service delivery. It's also important to prove that there are consequences for every action taken not only by accounting officers, but by executive as well. DPSA is a critical department to oversee other departments. There should be zero tolerance for non-compliance. However, agree with what the deputy president has said. As, as parliament, we have, the portfolio committee has a responsibility to play their, uh, to play their role. Let us leave this process no, and let it be please. discussed by the portfolio committee. But however, Deputy President, member, my question is that I'm afraid how, how, how are you as the leader of government business making sure that the resolutions of this members, house are, are implemented? Honorable members, please stop screaming. That's the job of the chair in the house. Don't do that. Deputy President, no, no, no. Don't, don't tell me that. You're out of order. In the first place, that's, that's really stretching it now. Don't think about that. Please. Uh, Deputy President. Deputy Speaker, there was such a noise, I actually did not hear the last tale of what she was asking. Because they don't want to hear that. Uh, uh, repeat that question. The question, the question is that, as the leader of government business, point of how is he making sure no, no, no. that the Deputy Speaker taken by the government the one minute are implemented in Deputy government? Speaker. Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, please. No, you the can. one minute has expired. Members. What Honorable do you allow her to speak? Honorable members. Her time has expired, Chief. Honorable members. Ah. Honorable members. Deputy Speaker. You did Honorable not members, give our member the opportunity to repeat the question Honorable because members, of time. Honorable members, and we are awarding that member a second. Honorable members, I've been you must, you must be consistent. Honorable member, I have consistently requested you to be quiet, to lower your voices, not to because it improves the quality of hearing in the house. If you don't do that, you kill it. Your member here has just asked a question. Your member Deputy in front speaker. here, all right? Deputy Speaker. Your member here are allowed Deputy to speaker, ask a question I when I shouldn't you? have done that, okay? I think I've you done need that. to be consistent. Look at you now. You're talking, no. nobody yes. recognizes you. No, don't no. do that. Can you no. recognize me, Deputy Speaker? No, oh, no. honorable members, Can you, you speak recognize me? when you're not supposed to speak in the Can first place. Can you recognize me? You have violated the rules. Can no. you recognize me? No, I'm not. We are proceeding okay. now. Deputy, Deputy, Deputy Speaker. President. Yes, Honourable Member, you what are you raising? You cannot say that we're violating the rules of Parliament if you are doing it yourself. Honourable Member. You clearly said to Honourable Medisha, sit down, your time is up. He couldn't get the last part of his question, and but you allow it when it happens in the INC Honourable, benches. Honourable Carter, you were not here when Honourable Haula stood and asked your question. All right? You were not here. You were not here. And Says this, who? This is the problem. Says who? You, you, you take your seat, you're out of order. Take your seat. You are the only one that is out of order, Deputy Speaker. Okay, thank you very much for that observation. Honorable On members. The point of order, Deputy Speaker. What's the point of order, Honorable Member? Deputy Speaker, you are consistently doing this every day. And you think this is your house. Honorable this Member. This is not your house. There are rules Honorable in member. Parliament. And if you are giving it to the ANC to rep uh, repose the question, then all of us must get an opportunity to do that. This is not your house. Honorable so member, please take respect your us, because you, when you don't respect us, Honorable you demand member, re respect and then you don't Honorable do member, it. take please. your seat. I respect the rules. You don't. I respect you. Take your seat, please, Honorable Member. And the rules require that if a decision has been made by the presiding officer, if you want to challenge it, please do it properly. You know the rules. 
Please do that. Please Honorable do that Deputy Speaker. So that we address it, so that it doesn't arise. Honorable Step Deputy evidence. Speaker. Honorable Carter. Respectfully so. We do address communication to the office of the speaker and to your office, and you never reply to any of it. Like for apology that you are supposed to do in the House for the way you treated Honorable Medisha. We have that replied. We do put Honorable member, through, please take. You do not respond no. to it. Honorable member, please take your seat. We have already responded to you. Uh, uh, don't worry about that one. It's answered. Um, uh, Deputy President, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Honorable point of order, uh, Speaker. Yes, what's the point of order, Honorable Member? You are making a mistake. You must withdraw. You are saying Khawula rose and asked a question. I have not asked a single question. It's only one Khawula in the House. Yes, and you commented, right, Honorable Member? I asked a question. Withdraw that because you are misleading Parliament, saying that I've asked questions. I haven't asked questions yet. All right, I'm Honourable. here to ask one. Honorable member, I think I want to I want to rule on this thing comprehensively, and I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, let's proceed, honourable deputy president. Deputy, deputy uh, speaker. I'm, yes, honourable member. I would like to be recognised. Yes. Thank you. Whenever the honourable Carter is speaking, there is howling and catcalling and meowing from the ANC benches. I would ask you humbly, sir, to ask the whips to discipline their members. It is demeaning to the female members of this house to be catcalled in that way, and it is specifically directed at Honorable Carter. And I think it is unparliamentary, and I would like you to call them to order. Thank you. Honorable members, that's correct, and that point of order is sustained. Please, uh, you know the conduct. Honorable members, can I appeal to all of us to behave appropriately and not scream at anyone, no matter how intolerant we are of their views? Uh, it is incumbent upon us that others can do the same thing to you, and it would be completely out of order. Uh, I request you to really uh, uh, behave appropriately. Honorable Deputy President. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid I have to say to you that I did not hear the question in full. As she was trying to repeat it, there was too much noise and I didn't hear it. Okay. Honorable, Honorable President, we will have to uh, go over that. Honorable Filtani, it's your turn, sir. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Deputy. Honorable President. Waters, Honorable, Honorable Deputy Chief Whip. Um, please, man. You see, heckling, it's not a bad idea. But when you repeat what you called unparliamentary comments across the floor, we can't but hear it from where we are sitting. So I plead with you not to do that, please. And let's Dep not do that. Deputy Speaker, it's amazing you hear me say it, but no one from the ANC. No, 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 Maybe no, no. you need a hearing aid in Honourable, your right ear. Honorable members, please, uh, let's not do that. It's inappropriate. Two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. Honorable, Phil, Honorable, Honorable Waters, I've spoken to you. Can you stop? Uh, Honorable, Honorable Waters, please. Honorable Waters. Honorable member, I have spoken to you, please. Honorable member, stop talking. Honorable Fitan, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. From the mixed responses you have given to this answer, it is clear now why so many ministers are not brought to book when they fail to discharge their duties. You say it's the president's function and authority to fire which is the extreme end. And you say it is none of your business to bring them to book. But earlier you said that you will attend to this matter. So we left confused. Now, as the committees of this parliament, we still depend on the cooperation of the majority party in order for ministers of the ANC to be sanctioned. What are the specific and transparent methods of bringing to book Ministers who are delinquents. Thank you. Honorable Deputy President. Uh, I should have added on the earlier one. Uh, 
more information with regards to uh, Minister Mutambi. My information is that the matter, her matter is before the portfolio committee. And that, that portfolio committee, the chairperson of that portfolio committee was elected this morning. Now, that is the information I have. Now, the portfolio committee itself must deal with this matter and deal with all the issues related to Minister Motambi. Now, when I said that I will address this matter, it was precisely to make sure that indeed the portfolio committee uh, does deal with this matter. And so it is now before the portfolio committee, and that is where it's going to be dealt with. So beyond that, clearly I cannot do. But uh, in the end, it is the president who has to deal with members of the executive in the end in relation to their jobs. Now, I raise issues at the cabinet level about various matters, the attendance, the various matters, re uh, responses to questions and all that. But in the end, it is the president who is responsible. I hope that helps you a lot. Thank you very much. Honourable members, we move to the next question asked by Honourable J. L. Matlangu to the Deputy President. Deputy President, question 34. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Constitutional Assembly process uh, represented what I would call a unique moment in the history of our nation. Although there were strongly opposing positions as we were drafting the Constitution, it was possible, even with all that, to reach agreement because there was sufficient commitment to the goal of a peaceful, non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic South Africa. From that period, we drew strength and lessons to deal with contemporary challenges. We are required as leaders to see beyond the immediate interests of ourselves and our organizations. We are bound by history to work together with a view of moving South Africa forward. The Constitutional Assembly process was possible because leaders of our country engaged each other on matters of substance and were prepared to negotiate in good faith. And a num it's pleasing to see that a number of those leaders who were involved in this process are still here I can cite Honorable Butelezi, who was a very active member of that whole process, is still here, and a number of others on this side. And all of them were bound by history to work together. And in a way, it was almost a situation whether they liked it or not, they needed to work together to produce the South Africa that we have today. The Constitutional Assembly process was possible because leaders engaged each other on matters of substance and were prepared also to negotiate in good faith. Now, as the country faces several challenges, including slow growth and high unemployment, similarly, leaders are called upon to guide our nation to greater and better things. Such engagement is taking place amongst leaders in government, in business and labor, on matters and measures that need to be taken to reignite growth and create jobs in our economy. As leaders of different political parties, we need to ensure that we act at all times in the interests of South Africa, at all times in the interests of our people as a whole. 
We need to show South Africans that collectively we as leaders remain committed and capable of resolving the many challenges that our country faces. We must consistently, Honorable Deputy Speaker, be led by the needs, the feedback and suggestions of ordinary South Africans who, poss who possess a wealth of ideas, a wealth of knowledge about how to move South Africa forward. Our leadership must flow from our ability to listen and to learn from the citizens of our country and the communities across the nation. Working together, we can move South Africa forward. I have no doubt about this. Thank you very much. Honorable General Matango. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Deputy President, congratulations with your Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of your leadership role during that period, a grueling 730 days of constitution drafting. And thank you for your elo eloquent uh, response. As the ANC, we concur with your elucidation. The follow-up question is, what will it take for the current leadership, both here in South Africa and in SADC, to learn and do, sacrificing their narrow interest in pursuit of the common good of the people in line with the leaders that you referred to earlier on, in our cause, I mean, in the cause that we have identified ourselves and measures that need to be taken to address the triple challenges that are facing our country, which is unemployment, poverty, and inequality. I thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. Deputy President. I guess, Honorable <coughs> Matangu, what leaders need to finally be aware of is that there's no better way of resolving problems rather than working together for the common good of our people. And they obviously need to agree on a vision, on a shared future, and on the interests of our people as a whole. And I found that once that type of agreement is reached on a vision, a clear vision of where we want the country to go to and a shared future, people become much more cooperative, knowing that by so doing, they are not casting their differences aside. They are agreeing on a common vision, a shared future, and the program that needs to drive that vision and that shared future. You talk about SADC. We have proposed such in another country where I myself, as Deputy President, am involved in Lesotho. After the holding of the SADC uh, summit, it is precisely what we suggested. We said the various political parties in Lesotho need to cast away their various differences and sit down to craft a future for the people of Lesotho. Now, they are meant to have a, a national dialogue, which we hope they will hold soon, and it is out of that type of dialogue that they'll be able to craft a common vision and a common future for all the people. Now, similarly here, we've got a number of overarching problems in our own country. The one is unemployment. And if we were to all collectively sit down, like what the government is doing now with business, if we were able to collectively sit down and address the challenges, the real challenges that our country faces, which is unemployment right across the board, I am sure that we would be able to come up with solutions. It requires determination on the part of leaders, and that leaders must not hide behind the figs of uh, petty differences. They must, the fig leaves of petty differences, they must be able to say, we agree on one thing and one thing, which is a clear vision of where to take, of how to address the issue of unemployment, and we work together to achieve that goal. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. 
Honorable Mekao. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Deputy President, I think we need to bring this uh, subject closer to home. You, as leader of government business, have from time to time been assuring this House that members of the executive will be in this House when we have sessions like this. Even today, in your presence, look around you. During the last few days, there hasn't been <coughs> anybody. The question is very simple. It is a failure of leadership on your part. Now, the question for me that is very, very important is that if you are not able to whip these members into line now, how are you going to be able to do it if you become the president of this country? Deputy President. Deputy Speaker, maybe what, what I should have brought is really, rather than... Uh, uh, what I should have brought is, is uh, uh, if you like, the, the apologies list that I was dealing with earlier when we were in cabinet committees. Many of the ministers who were supposed to be sitting here had traveled with the president to China. Now, when BRICS, listen, when BRICS meets, when BRICS meets, we interface with other countries that take their country's participation in BRICS rather seriously. And they make sure that they participate at the highest level and the most appropriate level because in the BRICS summit, we've got a number of other tasks and groups and task teams and ministerial committees that have to be meeting all the time during the whole session of BRICS. The Chinese bring an army of their senior officials. The Brazilians do the same. The, the Russians do the same. And, and the Indians do the same. And we are similarly expected. And we are the smallest participant in BRICS. But we've got to be punching at the same level as they are punching. And so when you see members of the executive absent here, many of them, and I can name almost each one who is not here, that they have been in BRICS processes, in BRICS sessions, in BRICS ministerial committees doing a lot of things. So on a day like this, on a day like this, I'd like you to be kind, to be kind to the executive, knowing that this time round, they've been traveling with the president to BRICS. The president arrived this morning, but many of them are still traveling because they've had to come on commercial flights. So they are on the way, and uh, please be kind and, and accept their apology. Thank you very much. You. Honorable Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Yes, I remember. Deputy Speaker, on a point of privilege. The Deputy President knows full well that members of the Parliament, according, members of the Cabinet, according to this document, are accountable to this House. They're not accountable to BRICS. How on earth are, you, how on earth are they prioritizing BRICS over this, of this House? Honourable. On a point of order, Honourable uh, Deputy Speaker. Yes, what's the point of order? Honourable Deputy Speaker. Yes. The DA asked a question to the DP, yes. and he responded. Yes. What more does they want? What more do they want from him? Okay. He responded to your questions. Honorable Just keep quiet and listen. Honorable members, please. Honorable members, please. It would be don't. very Honorable easy to keep Honorable quiet and listen and have a decent answer. Honorable there are no Hazen. decent answers. He sounds Honorable more like Stain Mr. Hazen. Zuma every day. Honorable Stain Hazen, I didn't recognize you. Please uh, let us not go there. Honorable Singh, go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Deputy President, congratulations on a coveted award. Quite coincidentally, just the other day, I found a 20-year-old copy of Reader's Digest, July 1997. And in it was an article with a very young-looking Deputy President on Countdown to the Constitution, South Africa's second miracle. I'll share it with you a little later, uh, where the miracle came about. But Honorable Deputy President, those were the days of principled leadership, like you spoke about. 
unity of vision across the multi-party spectrum, and a royal road lay ahead for the people and economic future of South Africa. Today, we do not see that. What are you doing, Honorable Deputy President, as leader of government business, and as an example of principal leadership to ensure that government is purged of its current leadership crisis, which seems dominated by some who are only concerned in furthering their own self-serving interests. Thank you. Deputy President, in everything that we do as leaders, and indeed as leaders of government, we should be guided by our constitution. Our constitution embodies the values that we want to guide us in everything we do. It has crafted a clear vision for our country. And if any one of us takes the trouble to read the preamble to our constitution and read that wonderful poetry that is pregnant with so much promise, a clear vision of where we want to take this country, that is where we should start. And it is this constitution that should be heralding us forward and making sure that we achieve our objectives. Will we falter along the way? Yes, it is possible that we will falter along the way, but the important thing is, will we be able to correct our ways? Having fallen, having faltered, and like, you know, if we make mistakes, can we correct those mistakes? And I would say that is how we should be judged. And that is how the leadership, not only on this side, should be judged, but the leadership that sits in this house collectively, because we've got a very well-crafted constitution that sits as the lodestar and that should guide our behavior, all of us collectively. So that is the real litmus test that we should use. And thank you very much for raising the matter. Yeah. Honorable Mwabe. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Honorable Deputy President, our constitution is a result of a compromise, we normally say that, uh, which was a necessity in that time to avoid the possibility of a civil war. However, many people today are increasingly critical of this compromise and refer to it as a sellout in favor of the white people, especially when it comes to the land question. Could the Deputy President please comment on this trend? Thank you. Honorable Deputy President. Our constitution was crafted at a certain point in time in the history of our country. And those who crafted the constitution took the trouble and the time to weigh up the balance of forces that existed at the time, but also to focus on what our people wanted. Our people wanted freedom. Our people wanted stability. And our people wanted to share the yoke of oppression and exploitation. And in doing so, we had to weigh up our own strengths and the strengths of, as we call them, the enemy at the time, and agreed collectively that that moment in history gave all of us an opportunity to make a breakthrough, to separate ourselves from a horrible past which was apartheid. Did it mean that we had achieved everything that we had struggled for over the years? The answer is no. But it gave us a breakthrough. It gave us an opportunity which we could utilize to win further gains. And I'd like to believe that in the 23 years of our freedom, we have been able to utilize the opportunity that that breakthrough gave us. Have we made missteps along the way I must say, yes, we have, because no one, no organization is ever perfect. Are we trying to address those missteps? And I would say enthusiastically, yes. Were there things that we could have done differently? The answer is yes. There are many things that we could have changed immediately, and we took our time, and because the leadership, and some of them are sitting here, wanted to build a nation. They wanted to very carefully usher us into a South Africa that would deliver a better life for all. Now, in many ways, we've made progress. We've made progress in delivering a South Africa that is better than the South Africa that our people lived under. But we all agree 
that the glass is not full. The glass is in fact half full, and what we are seeking to do now is to try to improve the lives of our people using the platform that we have. We've built a very good platform, we've built a very good system which can enable us to move forward. Now, the real call for all of us is, can we all work together to move South Africa forward? We've got a great foundation. The Constitution gives us that. We've got a leadership that is there that wants to move the country forward, and our people are ready to walk this journey with us. And therefore, I would say that much as we have not achieved everything we, have, we needed to, we've made great advances, and the call on all of us is to consolidate the victories that we have made and move forward with determination to truly improve the lives of our people. Thank you very much. Honourable Members, question number 35 has been asked by the Honourable Schlengwa to the Honourable Deputy President. The Honourable Deputy President. Honourable House Chair, the decision to grant Mrs. Grace Mugabe diplomatic immunity was taken by the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Honourable Maite Nkwana Mashabani. She, was, she has indicated that she did so in terms of Section 7.2 of the Diplomatic Immunities and Privileges Act, a piece of legislation that the minister administers. The minister has sent correspondence to the speaker of this house in this regard, and I understand that the relevant portfolio committee is now seized with this matter. Furthermore, both the Order Honourable Members. Order Honourable Members. Both the Democratic Alliance and Afri Forum have approached our courts to review this decision, which they are entitled to in every way possible. I trust that this House, through the portfolio committee process, and taking into account the court's proceedings that are currently underway will deal with the matter uh, on whether or not the minister's decision was appropriate. This is a difficult case in the light of the complexities of balancing diplomatic conventions as well as protocols against the imperatives of natural justice. Where violence against women and children is concerned, the authorities must exercise their duties in line with the applicable law and in the furtherance of the goal to end this scourge, whomever may be affected. So all I would say on this matter, House Chair, is that there are two processes that are underway. There is the portfolio committee process, and there is also the court process. Now, even if we may think that the one may not be as successful as the other, but certainly the court process, through the exercise of the powers that our judiciary has, they will be able to deliver a solution, an end, or a judgment in this regard, and we will then be able to, to know what should have happened. So I would, I would say, let us then leave it at that level, uh, even as we insulting and saying, shame on you, this and that. In the end, uh, in the end, it is the courts of our country who will make a determination. Thank you very much. The Honourable Schlengwa. Order, Honourable Members. Let us give the Honourable Member an opportunity to put the question. Honourable Chairperson, thank you very much. Mr. Deputy President, let's get real. Why is it that it must be courts all the time?
that must tell the ANC government what to do. Why do you fail to do the right thing for South African citizens? A dangerous precedent has been set with the issue of President Omar al-Bashir, and the court said to tell you that you are wrong. You then go and sacrifice the South African, Gabriela Engels, at the altar of expediency, and allow Mrs. Mugabe to leave the country, leaving her wanting here in this country. When will you put South Africans first? You, you, have, uh, you have sacrificed human rights. The Dalai Lama has refused a visa because you said you are protecting diplomatic relations. When is it that the ANC government will take the side of that which is right when dealing with the issues of, diploma of diplomacy? We cannot possibly, Honorable Deputy President, have a situation where a South African is left, left helpless because there is power on the other side of Mrs. Mugabe. So whilst we wait for the courts, I would like to hear your views. Do you think it is correct what happened and provide the necessary leadership so that you can actually be a glimmer of hope that there is somebody in the ANC benches who actually believes in human rights because this current prevailing situation is not in the interest of our constitution and most certainly does no justice for Gabriela Engels. Thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. Honorable Klengwa, we do believe in human rights and we do believe in their exercise and uh, you'll also remember that it was this side of the house that as early as early as 1912 that believed that South Africa should be a country that has human rights and throughout the years you can go and study the Freedom Charter, the African claims, and all the other documents ready to govern. You'll find that this side of the House has always been strong on the issue of human rights. Now, on this matter, the minister, the minister has taken a decision. Now, the, 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 the very good thing is that we have a constitution, constitution that has a separation of powers, where we have the executive and where we have the legislature and the judiciary. And where the executive makes mistakes, takes certain decisions, we have a system that has checks and balances. And what we should now allow with this decision having been taken is to allow the courts of our country, who are the, who are the arbiters, who are the arbiters and are able to resolve disputes between various components of government. And it is not a situation where we, we are running to the courts all the time for assistance. This is a case in point, and as I said to you, this is a difficult one, and we would like the courts to rule on it. And I would like the court indeed to rule as quickly as possible on this matter so that we know precisely how the executive should behave in future. So I await that. And if you like, I would say we welcome the fact that the matter has been taken to court. Uh, we will not run away from that. And the courts will then take a decision on this matter. But rest assured, we will never waver on the issue of human rights. Thank you very much. The order, order, honorable members. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the honorable Kalisa. Is the honorable member here? House, House Chair. Are you more, taking the follow-up yes. on behalf of the member? More often than not, when the deputy president is found wanting on moral questions, such as human rights questions. Common and often regular offenders, such as Zuma and, and them, appears to be born again Christians, almost close to sainthood. Now I want to ask him, is he prepared to go down with people like Zuma and them and take the, the fall for them? Why can't he stand up now in defense of the South Africans? The Honorable Deputy President. I, I, I didn't get 
the real sort of heart of the question. Am I prepared to go down on my knees, or am I prepared to go down underground, or am I prepared to go down wherever? So I didn't quite, quite get the question. What we have said, what we have said is that the African National Congress and this government places the issue of human rights extremely high. In fact, if you like, it was this issue that really inspired the African National Congress to be formed. And we will not retreat on the issue of human rights, on respect for human rights. Thank you very much. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Mbele. During this reply session, you've spoken a lot about the missteps made, the mistakes made, and the falterings made by this government. But the fact is real leadership would be one that learns from those mistakes and that enforces accountability to set a new benchmark that prevents them being repeated again. And what we've seen with the Grace Mugabe episode is a situation where principle was sacrificed on the altar of political expediency. So, facts on the table, will you admit that this ANC government does not, in fact, believe in or practice principled and accountable governance? Because if it did, Mrs. Mugabe would not have been allowed to get away scot-free. The Honorable Deputy President. It is this government, more than any government that I know, that has ever existed in this country, that is very strong on all the issues that you mentioned. Responsibility, accountability, and doing the right thing. So this is what defines the African National Congress, the government that currently governs this country. Thank you very much. The Honorable Nguabe. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair, Deputy President. Has the government not created a dangerous precedent by overriding the rule of law for political reasons and giving effect to the concept of some are equal but some are more equal than others? Our constitution guarantees in section nine that all are equal before the law. What step can the government take to redeem itself in the eyes of ordinary South Africans and restore our faith in section nine of the constitution? Uh, which guarantees equality before the law. Thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. The government will continue to state and repeat that all the people of our country are equal before the law, and nobody may be treated better than any other or in a much more favorable way than any other South African. So we are all subject to equal treatment, without any favor, without any privileges being loaded on anyone else. So that I am able to, to confirm, and that is what drives us as the governing party of this country. Thank you very much. The last question has been asked by the Honorable Kwankwa. On a point of order, Chairperson. Yes, Honorable Member. Commissioner, I just want to have some clarity from you. I noted, I, I had pressed here to to make a follow-up question. I note that you recognized a number of uh, people, but you, you, you recognized somebody who had not pressed the button. I don't know how the person who's not in this house could have pressed the button to ask the question. But now you recognize somebody who volunteers to take this question. Well, I have pressed and my, my button shows that it is reflecting there. Order, honorable members. Can you please explain to me, I don't know what these ones are talking about. Can you explain to me how is it possible that you recognize somebody who's not pressed the button when I'm here and I press the button? Honor yes, Honorable Member, just to, just to clarify the matter, your name did appear on the screen, but there were 12 requests for follow-up questions, 
and your name was number eight on that list. And in terms of the rules, we take four follow-up questions. In terms of the member, will you just allow me, will you take your seat, please? I'm responding to you. In terms of the follow-up question that was asked, the name of the honorable member of the EFF who is not in the house appeared. And then thereafter was the name of the member who eventually took that follow-up question. And that's why I allowed that member to take that follow-up question. However, the point that you raise is that members must continuously be reminded that if they request a follow-up question, that they do press their own buttons. And unless that is done, we will not recognize them. However, in this instance, that honorable member Matthias's name did appear on the list that we had in front of us. And that's why I allowed it. May, may I uh, follow up on that question, Chair? Yes. Oh, please. I didn't no. arrive here. I'm not, you're not doing no, me a favor. No, no, just continue, honorable Can member. Can you give me a chance, please, to Order, speak? Order, honorable members. Order. Just be calm. Continue, honorable member. Chair. I think we must advise the members in the House. If somebody who is not a person presses a button, that is fraudulent behavior. No, no, it's fraudulent behavior. It is fraudulent behavior, which is a crime at law. And we can't make the law this House, we can't make the law in this House and break it in this House. No, make it here and break it on the street. No, thank you, Honorable Member. Your point is noted. However, as I say, that the name of that Honorable Member who eventually took that follow-up question was on the list of 12 names that was in front of us. And that's why we allowed it. Chairperson, could I please just ask you on a point of clarity? No, on, on terms of which rule? Um, I've, I've dealt with your leader who raised the I point of order. I understand that. I just want to know what from more you, do you, want as to the, know? For you as the presiding officer, mm. do you work on the format that the names appear, like number one, two, three, four, five, at push the button, and you take the first? Or do you work it on your prerogative to decide which of the eight names or 12 names are selected? As just on a point of clarity. No, we take the names as they appear on the screen. And then by also allowing that we have a good spread of participation from the different members. For instance, if COPE had, for instance, 15 members in the House, which they don't have, and all 15 names appear from COPE, then we will just give one member of COPE the opportunity to ask the question. That is to ensure that we have broad participation in the House. I think that settles the matter now. Okay. Chair, it actually doesn't. That opens it up. If I can no, explain honorable to member, you, I've question, addressed the matter. question, question Will number you take two. Your seat now, please. The Congress of the People was first on honorable the list. Member, question take three, your we were seat. first on the list, but we were never given an opportunity. Honorable member, we've exhausted this point. Please take your seat. Thank you. I've been informed that we're order, open point of order, Chair. Order, honorable members. The point of order, please. In terms of what rule are you raising, honorable member? I shall explain, point of order. No, Honorable see, Member, there's no such a rule as explain a point of order. That which has why, been why raised are you, here. Why are you rising? The uh, Deputy Speaker there, when we were supposed to speak, simply told, instructed our person to say, whether you like it or not, I shall decide. It's me that decides. No. I honorable the same honorable thing. member, we are now delaying the question session. This is, is, is it the same thing that we're doing this yourself? This is a wrong forum. You are in the wrong forum. Raise the forum, in the meeting in the appropriate forum, the rules or sub rules committee, and then we can attend to that. I cannot answer. I can I'll deal check. with the issues as it's in front of me. I'll yes, check. honorable member. I'm rising in terms of rule 92 of this house. Honorable Lekota made a remark that there were fraudulent behaviors here. And the, members who, the member who stood up is from the benches of the economic freedom fighters. Honorable Lekota must actually withdraw because he's speaking to our benches. Honorable, honorable members, honorable members, I've dealt with the matter, okay? I've dealt, I've dealt with the matter I, I want to request the WIPs to discuss this matter in the appropriate forums, right? 
And although the Honourable Member has made a broad statement, I think we must be very, very aware of what the rules say, that we cannot cast dispersions on members of the House. But I've dealt with this point of order and I want to get to the question that was raised by the Honourable Kwankwa. And I've informed, I was busy informing the House that the Honourable Fultane will take charge of the first supplementary question on behalf of the Honourable Kwankwa in accordance with Rule 137.10a. And I will now request the Honourable Deputy President to reply to the question asked by the Honourable Kwankwa. The Speaker. Honourable Deputy President. Speaker, yes. I rise on Rule 92. Yes, Honourable Member. You are saying you have dealt with the matter, but you are raising a point that an aspersion has been casted. Because the only person who rose at that time is a member of the EFF, which is Honourable Sam Matias. So the member is saying that he had fraudulently risen up. So we are asking him to withdraw. So there is no way of saying that you have dealt with the matter. We don't know if we are overruling him or sustaining his point that we are sitting here with frost dust when we have to rise. Please rule on the matter. No. Honourable, honourable members, I've made a ruling in this regard. I've made a ruling in this regard and I want to proceed to the reply to question number six. The Honourable Deputy President. Honourable House Chair, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, but it does not belong to abusers, racists and bigots of any time, kind. The Constitution provides the basis for a new South African identity and enables South Africans to have a common bond. It is our responsibility as individuals, as institutions, and the state to forge that new identity and establish that bond. In short, we all bear responsibility for building social cohesion we need to promote increased interaction between South Africans from different social and racial groups so that each group discovers in the other common humanity. It is very difficult to measure social cohesion. Where we have indicators, the results are often mixed. For example, the proportion of people who thought that race relations were improving declined from about 70% in 2000 to the current figure of 37% in 2015. In 2000, 85% of the population were confident of a happy future for all races. This has declined to 65% in 2015. On the other hand, progress has been made to address social and economic inequality through the provision of housing, basic services, education, and health care. The racial incidents to which the member refers to offer a glimpse of the very worst in our society. However, the way that most South Africans reacted to these incidents with shock and condemnation reflects the extent to which the basic values of our Constitution have become embedded in our national consciousness. These ugly and humiliating encounters among citizens should not just be met with tweets, Facebook posts, media reports, and research studies. They must be met with the full might of the law, unapologetic bigots and abusers and racists must be put in their place and that place is off our streets. We must work to create an inclusive, tolerant society, but those who patently refuse to be part of this society must indeed be dealt with in terms of our law. I thank you. The Honorable Fultane. Well said, uh, Deputy President. And the admission um, of worsening situation is much appreciated. Racism runs very deep in the South African society. Social cohesion cannot only rely on the justice system. 
due to the long process of receiving justice finally. Therefore, there is a high attrition rate of these cases not going through the justice system like so many uh, unreported cases of uh, rape. The justice system is not sufficient, does not offer sufficient deterrent for racial attacks, let's admit. Now my question is, what proactive social programs are there being initiated by government to enhance interracial social cohesion, taking it beyond just the mere tolerance level. Such programs should bring about social congruence of peoples, instead of the ravaging diametrical opposition that we see daily in our country. What proactive social programs does your government offer? That's the question, thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The government embarks on a number of initiatives to enhance social cohesion. And I can cite a few, and there's one major one that is going to be coming shortly. The various national days that we have, a day, 27th of April, which is an important day, a Freedom Day, the 16th of June, the 9th of August, and now we are going to the, 21st, the 24th of September, which is National Heritage Day, are days during which government tries to bring the people of South Africa together to celebrate their success in becoming one nation, but also to commemorate important days. The National Heritage Day is a particularly important one where government through this initiative seeks to bring people together so that they can participate in family-oriented activities, but also in a national activity. Now, we often say we would like all South Africans to participate. Now, we're always pained when a few in our communities do not even make an appearance, when a few do not even lift their feet to come and participate in these. Because quite often these occasions give us an opportunity to display our culture, to display even our languages, to display even our national uh, you know, clothing and all that. And many and a number of groupings in our country stay away. Now we want to make a call ahead of this day that all South Africans should find a way, a time, an opportunity to participate in these days because these are important initiatives that government embarks upon. The others are dialogue processes that are led by uh, the ministry that Minister Mutetwa leads. The ministry uh, that embarks on these dialogues and bring people together to talk about their South African nationhood, to talk about what is a common identity amongst all of us. And the Moral Regeneration uh, Committee also seeks to find ways of doing that. Our religious leaders, right across various religions, also work with government to embark on many of these activities. Now, these are active programs in which the government also allocates funding, and we invite all South Africans to be part of this process of celebrating our South Africanness and making sure that we participate in being this one nation that we should all be very proud of. Thank you very much. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Malloy. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade President, for your comprehensive and uh, well thought of answer. Now, given the unquestionable commitment of the ANC and the ANC-led government to transform South Africa into a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and a prosperous country, to what extent are the principles of such common nationhood, national pride, and civic responsibility being assimilated by all South Africans? And moreover, because you spoke about moral regenerations, what should be the role and responsibility 
of the moral regeneration in fostering social cohesion. Thank you very much. The Honorable Deputy President. The various initiatives are right across the country. We even seek to inculcate these very important values at the school level to get South Africans to be proud of their national symbols, to, be, to get South Africans to uh, not only know their national anthem, but also to try and speak other languages other than those that they were brought up with. And this, in our view, would promote uh, a common South African citizenship that all of us can be proud of. Now, the government is reaching out just beyond uh, even schools the sp in the, on the sporting field. That is precisely what uh, we are also seeking to do. In higher institutions, in ed institutions of higher learning, that is also what we are seeking to do. Now, in order for all this to be successful, it requires the active participation of all key stakeholders in our country, be they business, be they political parties, be they trade unions, and if all of us could participate in the nation building effort where we engender and encourage social cohesion, we would then be able to get rid of all these prejudices that a number of people still have in our country. If we acted as one, as collectively as South Africans and embraced the values that are embodied in our constitution, we would make a great deal of headway. Thank you, House Chair. The next follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Kubisa. Thank you very much, House Chairperson. Honorable Deputy Speaker, we understand that a lot of resources were pumped in in dealing with anti-racism in our country. There was an international anti-racism conference, national racism conference, etc. But we see the resurgence of racism in different quarters of our country, certain quarters of our country. Just recently, we saw a PR company from Britain, uh, Bell Pottinger, coming to sow the seeds of division and discord within our country. And they've admitted, and eventually they saw was to resign. They kept on passing the buck. The owner says, no, he was misled. The CEO said, I was misled. And uh, I just want to ask from you, uh, Honorable Deputy President, Will there be any steps that perhaps will be taken to ensure that uh, this company is, is called to come and account? Because seemingly it was protecting the interest of the Guptas and certain individuals. And uh, what is it can be done to mitigate the damage that this company has done? Thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. What I do know is that this company has had to account to its uh, British uh, standards organization uh, and coming here to South Africa I have not seen any sign of uh, this company being taken to book but at a political level I think uh, a lot of people have commented quite extensively about the influence that this company has had in terms of propagating propagating views that have had an influence of what happens here in South Africa, particularly when it comes to uh, propagating a very narrow racial type of uh, ideology or approach that uh, we, we find uh, very inimical with what we stand for here in South Africa. So in the South African marketplace, I don't know whether the PR agency that we have in South Africa has had to deal with them, but what I did see is how they were dealt with in the UK, which uh, seems to be affronted by what uh, Bell Pottinger has been seeking to do here in South Africa. Thank you. And the last follow-up question is to be asked by the Honorable Van Damme. Thank you, Deputy President. On the subject of Bell Pottinger, so we know that they've now been thrown out of the PRCA for exploiting racial tensions in South Africa for the benefits of the Gupta family and to Duzane Zuma, President Jacob Zuma's son. We also know that Bell Pottinger gave advice to the ANC Youth League and the Mkonto West Seas were military veterans. 
including praising a statement where Mr. Collins Maine, the leader of the ANC Youth League, threatened civil war in this country. As the Deputy President of the ANC, can you tell this House whether Bell Pottinger also gave advice to Lutuli House? Because we know, Deputy President, that the real client of Bell Pottinger was the ANC and not Oak Bay. The Honourable Deputy President. Thank you, Honourable House Chair. I am not aware that uh, Bell Pottinger gave advice to the African National Congress. Uh, and if, and indeed, if they did so, I guess as a Deputy President of the ANC, I would have been aware. So I'm not aware of that. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, that did not happen. And if it did happen, possibly it was not disclosed to me, but we would have found it very strange if they had given advice to the African National Congress. Thank you very much. Honourable Members, that concludes questions to the Deputy President. I want to thank the Honourable Deputy President. The Secretary will read the first order of the day. Consideration of recommendations for appointment on South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC Board. The Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Communications will introduce the report, the Honourable Matkangwana. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. This is the report of uh, Portfolio Committee on Communication. Noting that, that the main goal of the Portfolio Committee on Communication was to ensure continuous operations at the SABC, uninterrupted by the challenges faced by the SABC leadership, it is, the it is the committee that initially questioned the state of affairs at the public broadcaster, leading to the inquiry into the fitness of the SABC board. And what was of importance to the committee following the inquiry was the smooth transition of power from the interim board to the permanent board. And I must thank the portfolio committee members for their undivided attention and commitment that has helped us to present these names to the House today. Honorable House Chairperson, as you may be aware, that on the 2nd June, the committee published an advert calling for persons to be nominated to serve on the SABC board. The advert closed on the 30th June and the committee received 741 nominations. After a process of elimination of applicants who had not responded to the advertisement, the committee was left with 363 to consider for shortlisting. Committee met, and as per the Broadcasting Act, number four of 99, the committee, the names of the uh, 36 shortlisted candidates were published on the Parliament website for a period of five working days in order to allow the public to submit comments. The screening of all candidates was done, was conducted through SSA and the verification of qualifications by Human Resource Division during the, the same period. On 30th August and 1 September, we, the, we interviewed candidates, 30th to the 1st of September, we interviewed candidates with the exception of uh, Mr. Bauer was disqualified according to the Act, and Mr. Yassif Hafaji withdraw from the process. Yesterday on the 5th of September, the committee deliberated and emerged with the following names. I will read. The first one is Phoebe Potkriter Kubule, Mr. Krish Naidu, Mr. Kanye Silekwayama, Mr. John Matheson, Mr. Matata Tsedu, Ms. Nomvuiso Baki, Mr. Rachel, Ms. Rachel Kalidas, Mr. Makovitz, Mr. Bongumu Samakatini, Mr. Victor Rambau, Mr. Dikwanyana Mohuba, and Mr. Jack 
Palane. While noting the deliberation process was robust and mostly with consensus on most of the candidates, the DA objected to the following candidates. Mr. Bongumu Samakatin, Mr. Tinguanyane Mohuba, Mr. Krish Naidu, and Mr. Potkhiter uh, Kobule. The AFF objected to the following candidates, Mr. Krish Naidu and Mrs. Phoebe Potkhiter. Members will notice that in the whole 12, uh, and I think we've done badly on that, we have four women. Uh, everything else was done and some of the, mem of the candidates fell off because of the report of SSA. Uh, be that as it may, we agreed that uh, we present this report as it is and we move for the adoption of the report to be adopted by this August House. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. Are there any objections to the recommendation of the committee that Ms. Phoebe Potkiter Kubule, Mr. Krish Naidu, Ms. Kanyisile Kweyama, Mr. John Mattison, Mr. Matatu Tsedu, Ms. Nombuyusa Baji, Ms. Rachel Kalidas, Mr. Michael Markovitz, Mr. Bongo Musa Makatini, Mr. Victor Rambau, Mr. Dinkwanyana Mouba, and Mr. Jack Palane be recommended for appointment on the South African Broadcasting Corporation Board. Are there any objections? There are objections and there has been a request to make declarations, the Democratic Alliance. Thanks, Honorable Chair. During the SABC inquiry, members of the ad hoc committee sat for up to 12 hours a day hearing harrowing testimony from witness after witness describing deep set rot and complete collapse of good governance at the SABC. Amongst many other shocking revelations, the committee heard that the then Minister of Communications, Faith Mutambi, interfered in the coverage of news and in the affairs of the board, and as a result, there was an explicit and unprecedented bias in news coverage in favor of the ANC during the 2016 local government elections. With the dissolution of the board, the ANC was given the opportunity to give the SABC a fresh start by appointing a board filled with properly qualified and nonpartisan individuals. Individuals who would stand up and protect a strategic asset of our country against political interference. Instead of doing so, for the first time since the SABC inquiry, ANC members of the committee chose to use their majority to force four ANC cadres onto the board. The DA and other opposition parties strongly objected to the redeployment of ANC cadres Krish Naidu and Febi Porchita Kobulo due to their close proximity to the ANC. During interviews, Porchita Kobule revealed that she might be running for the ANC NSC in December if nominated. Naidu is currently employed as an ANC legal advisor in Lotuli House. Despite the best efforts of the DA and other opposition parties in the committee, it seems that CADA deployment is yet again to return to the SABC. CADA deployment is at the heart of the SABC's problems and has been the main reason for the disintegration of the public broadcaster and nonpartisan individuals should have been put above the ANC. The DA will not be supporting this report because of the ANC's actions in this regard. We will, however, hope that the board will prove us wrong and that we will once again have an SABC that the public, that, that the public of South Africa can be proud of. The EFF. As the EFF, we support the recommendation of Ms. Kanyisi Legoyama. We support the, the recommendation of Mr. Matata Tzedu and other nominated names. However, we want the House to register our serious objection with the recommendation of Mr. Chris Naidu and Ms. Phoebe Potrida. We thought after Ellen Chabalala, Dr. Ben Gubane, and all other previous chairperson who collapsed the SABC. The ANC would stop deploying people to the SABC and allow competent men and women based on merit 
to be appointed to the SABC board. In fact, Mr. Naidu even got permission and was sent from Lutuli House to the SABC. Ms. Patritar even confessed that she is an aspiring politician and she's just waiting for nomination to the ANC NEC. It's their own admission, not us. These are the very same people who tomorrow will be at the forefront of assault on the SABC independence and journalist freedom. The EFF also want to express regret that there is less representation of women, and that is why a chairperson must be an African woman. However, overall, it is a strong list of men and women who will not be easily swayed by the ANC manipulations. This team will indeed stabilize the SABC as it includes more people of integrity and skills than questionable characters. The SABC, a functioning and independent, independent SABC, has material consequences on our democracy. As a result, we need it to work, and we need it to be stable, and we wish the recommended people well in rebuilding the SABC. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The IFP. Honourable House Chairperson, with the appointment of a new board today, we can only hope that we're ushering in a new era for the SABC. In recent years, the SABC limped from one crisis to another. First, a financial crisis, a credibility crisis, and a crisis of leadership. Under Mr. Tlaudi Motswaneng, we witnessed our public broadcaster being turned into a state broadcaster. Mr. Motswaneng and his partner in crime, the former Minister of Communications, Minister Faith Mutambi, led an orchestrated campaign to capture the SABC for their own interests. What is now required is a new SABC board that will place pu the public interests far above commercial interests and political agendas. Never again should we allow the SABC board to be captured by the ANC or a faction of the ANC. And never again should we allow the ANC's employees to abuse and mismanage this institution. Looking at some of the names presented here today, the IFP believes that there are glimmers of hope. The majority of the individuals will serve the SABC well. Thus, we support some of these candidates, but not all of the names. We are concerned that at least two nominees are far too close to political power. Ms. Phoebe Potgitter Krubule is a key figure in the Nkosa Zana Dlamini leadership campaign, while Mr. Krish Naidu remains an ANC legal advisor and an ANC stalwart. We cannot allow these individuals to abuse their power and position to advance their respective political agendas through the SABC. That is something that we cannot allow. It is against this background that the IFP cannot support these names tabled today because against the ANC has abused the process for catered deployment purposes, opening the door once more for political interference. And at the heart of the previous crisis at the SABC was political interference. It will now be up to the new board to prove to us that they will not succumb to political power once more. The IFP wishes to thank all those who participated in the process of finding a new board and those who availed themselves for the interviews. Finally, we urge the incoming board to fiercely protect the SABC's independence and to fulfill its democratic mandate as a public broadcaster. Only then can we restore the dignity and integrity of the SABC. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The Congress of the People commends the Communications Portfolio Committee for the transparent, open, uh, public, participative manner in which this process was conducted. COPE thanks those members of South African society who offered themselves for appointment to the board. You represented a broad cross-section of our society and diversity of skills and experience. There were more deserving candidates amongst you than positions of the board. 
So we say to them a thank you. Now, apart from the suitability of candidates for appointment to the board, from a skills and experience point of view, it was important from COPE's perspective that those finally selected exhibit integrity and be above reproach. COPE thanks the interim board for its work in stabilizing the organization and is pleased that there will be continuity moving forward. While SCOPE will give its support to the list of those nominated by the committee, COPE must express its reservations regarding the insistence by the ANC in recommending certain persons with strong ties to ANC and to Mr. Zuma. This reservation stems from the dysfunctionality, corruption, and political abuse and factional uh, battles that have crippled and bankrupted the SABC because of uh, what is called CADA deployment by the ANC and its executive interference. The fact is that in quote, CADA deployment is in itself a corrupt practice and places any organization in a compromised position. Nonetheless, COPE thanks all parties on the committee for the mature, congenial, and cooperative manner in which this process was conducted. We are, after all, a multi-party democracy and not a single-party tyranny. COPE supports the report of the committee and those recommended for the appointment to the board. Now, moving forward, it will be up to the committee to ensure that we exercise appropriate oversight over the board and hold the SABC to account in the interest of the South African public. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The NFP. Thank you, Honourable House Chair. Let me start off, uh, Honourable House Chair, by thanking the Portfolio Committee for all its efforts and the very hard work, the long hours that they have spent in bringing this matter to finality eventually. Now, Honourable Chairperson, I don't understand what the hue and the cry is, because it is common knowledge that all political parties only employ their own cadres. The DA is no exception. They do that all the time, be it municipal managers, be it directors, be whoever it is. They all tend to do the same. Honorable Chairperson, on the contrary, I am not convinced. We are not convinced that the SABC. Honorable Sheikh, will you just take your seat? We are just saying that it is a man. Who is pinching on the moment? Abanya bantu na bafuna basu swela. Honourable member, it's not a point of order. Please take your seat. Aye, man. Please, Watch out please well. take your seat, honourable member. Continue, honourable Sheikh. Thank you, honourable House Chair. Order, honourable members. Honourable House Chair. Honourable House Chair. On the contrary. Honourable Sheikh, will you take your seat, please? Honourable House. Why are you rising, honourable member? I'm rising on rule number 84. Yes. When we address one another, let us respect a member. He mustn't say lo muntu lo. We are going to debate. I'll check the answer, to Honourable Member. Continue, Honourable Sheikh. Uh, Chairperson, on a point. Why are you order, rising, Honourable Member? Rule 92. Yes. On clarity, is this the ANC's declaration or the NFP's declaration? No, it, that, that's not a point of order, Honourable Member, and you know it. Honourable House Honourable Chair. Member. What is what is very very clear? If you don't tell the DA what they want to hear, then they have a problem with it. <laughs> And I think yesterday was an opportunity to actually expose them for what they really are. And thank you to all the other parties, including the EFF, for dealing with them appropriately yesterday. Honorable Chairperson, what is also clear, if we talk about the biasness of the SABC, in fact, if you look at the reporting of the, uh, of the SABC over the last couple of years, in fact, if you talk about biasness, they've been biased towards the interest of some of the opposition parties. 
And I can also allude to one other problem that we have, some of the smaller parties have been having. We have been marginalized and not getting the necessary coverage that we need to get. There is no balanced reporting in South Africa. It is more on what the Democratic Alliance, who pay their way through, get. And that is what it is all about, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, I hear people talking about credibility and things of a person like Krish Naidu. Now, let me add, Krish Naidu Order is a... Honorable members. Krish Naidu is a very capable and astute leader. One that I will honestly believe has integrity and together with the other members, as recommended here today by this portfolio committee, we believe that they will act in the interest of all South Africans, that they will ensure that all political parties in South Africa get free coverage, get coverage that is equal, that is transparent, and that is open. We believe that they will take the South African Broadcasting Corporation from the negative impact that it has created to one of very positive in the future. So we believe that the recommendations that you have made here today are indeed the correct ones, and we, the National Freedom Party, fully supports the recommendation of all members provided here today. Thank you. The UDM. Thank you, House Chair and Honorable Members. All the Honorable the Members. From the outset, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the Interim Board for its sterling work so far, and would like to take this opportunity again to say the mandate of the South African Broadcasting Co Corporation to inform, entertain, and educate the nation means that by Nola, Honorable Prolic, uh, means that the new board must not only ensure that the SABC is sustainable, but that it actually serves a broad, diverse public and not narrow interests of affection within the ruling elite. This is particularly important if you consider that the first chief, chief executive officer in the post apartheid era of, this, of the SABC, the late Mr. Zuelake Sisulu, laid a firm foundation for a robustly independent, transformed and dynamic public broad broadcaster that serves the people of the republic without fear or favor. So the new board must ensure that this foundation is reaffirmed, sustained, and advanced in the interest of the country and with unwavering loyalty to the supreme law of the land, the constitution of the republic. I want to say when we're busy with the ad hoc committee, the SABC inquiry, we wanted to make sure that the SABC does exactly as it is mandated by the public. However, we realized immediately shortly thereafter when we disbanded the the board, the old board, that it seemed as if what we're trying to do to make sure that the broad public broadcaster served its mandate properly was turned upside down because there were main instances where you felt like we removed the old board in order for the deputy president faction of the ANC to dominate the media and the SABC. It means that going forward, we must make sure that we don't do that. We don't correct any wrong or spin as more shiny because the fact that you had an inst in a few instances where the DP would be in a news bulletin for about three minutes. Ubu Zuguti, did we try to sort out the Zuma faction which was abusing the SABC so that the, N the, the DP faction of the ANC can do that? But now what is important is that this new board must not allow itself to be used and be caught up in the factional battles of the African National Congress, especially going to 2019. We are making these reservations to you, saying we are concerned about the two members who have close proximity to the African National Congress. However, if you look at the overwhelming number of the people, I think they are made up of capable leaders. I will come back to that. Honorable Swat. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, the ACDP joined other parties in spending considerable time 
and effort on the ad hoc committee into the previous board. And Parliament was widely commended as we agreed across political lines to find solutions to the many problems at the SABC. And we made a number of findings and recommendations that were accepted by this House. And one of the findings was that there was indeed undue political interference in the running of the SABC, particularly by Minister Faith Mutombi, and that this had contributed significantly to the problems at the SABC. And as a result, we said, quote, all political interference in the SABC's board's operations must be condemned. And that was accepted by this House. It seems, however, that that recommendation has fallen on deaf ears, given the fact that certain persons nominated today have strong links to the majority party. And it seems that we are repeating mistakes we made in the past and have learned nothing when it comes to the appointment of boards. Let us not forget that board members at the SABC are seldom serving their full terms because of the political infighting that is taking place. There have been three SABC boards, ex excluding interim boards, in the last 10 years. And how many GCOs? 12 GCOs in the per since 2008. Now, that is totally unacceptable. How can the public broadcaster be expected to perform its mandate effectively in terms of the Act given this instability at board level. And so we'd hoped that the ad hoc committee process would herald a dramatic turnabout following clean out of incompetent and politically connected board members. We've been encouraged by the reports from the interim board and even from certain members of the newsroom that there has been this turnabout. However, this good work may be undone with the links of new board members to the majority party. Now, those links do not necessarily disqualify a member, but there can be no doubt that political pressure will find its way into the boardroom, as has happened in the past, particularly as we lead up to the 2019 elections. And let us not forget, members, that a heavy price was paid in order to clean out the rot at the SABC. Witnesses were intimidated and threatened. A member of the SABC 8, Suna Fenter, died directly as a result of the stress caused by the stand she took in exposing the censorship and intimidation at the SABC. Members, we cannot afford to let the SABC down again by appointing politically affiliated board members. The, SABC, the ACDP will not support this report. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you come in, Honorable Koji, uh, Honorable Nkwankwa, may you please take a stand? Honorable Nkwankwa, I've been advised that the word is Masela means thieves. No, it doesn't. Honorable Nkwankwa. Yes. Do you agree with that uh, explanation? No, it's actually wrong. To okay. sell in Kosa also means to drink. When you Honorable Nkwankwa, I'll come back with the ruling. I'm not going to force you now to, to withdraw because maybe we understand languages differently. Thank you. Madam House Chair, yes. may I address you in terms of Rule 84 and 85 of the NA rules read together. Uh, the rules are very clear that no one may impute a proper motive against a member. But if you're referring to a political party, that is a different matter altogether. And you'll yes. recall that we've been called all sorts of names before yeah. that, uh, by members of that side of the House. Okay. But it, it's I only, know that. only if it's against a member. I, I have me. ruled on that, Honorable Stian Hazen. Can I please come back to the House? Honorable Koji. Thank you, Honorable Chair, comrades, and Honorable Members. Parliament recommends those who should serve on SABC board. In the recent past, we have seen boards at the SABC that did not serve their full terms with resignations and ugly public recriminations. We have not covered ourselves in glory in terms of the quality of the people elected to serve on the board. The APC hopes that this board will debunk the trend of recent times and stay united and focused on the important task of leading the SABC. I must confess that I do not necessarily know all the people being recommended. However, it is the presence of the members of the current interim board that gives me hope and faith that maybe we should give them the benefit of doubt. The members of the current interim board have proven themselves to be patriotic, 
serving the SABC with diligence, sacrificing time in the public good. They attended to their SABC work without taking a cent, recognizing that the SABC was ailing financially. They, save, they saved the SABC from ruin. They maneuvered in treacherous political and administrative alleys to end in punity for misconduct, hitting both the flies and tigers amongst the corrupt and the SABC. We thank them for getting the SIU to investigate thoroughly cases of corruption. Let the new board build on the foundation and momentum of the interim board. I thank you. Thank you, ANC. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. Board, uh, okay. Uh, honorable member, please take your seat for a while. Honorable member, what's your point of order? I've been funuk boza juto madami ni gabe be agakotwa na ngo tu ifu ifa. That's not a point of order. I'm not going to allow you to continue. I'll switch off your mic now. Continue, honourable member. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Let me indicate up front that the ANC support this report. Besides the excellent performance displayed by the candidates in the interviews, to us these are men and women of integrity whose credentials in society are unquestionable, <coughs> who possess the necessary skills to take the SABC to a higher level. As the ANC, we are satisfied with the product because this was a very transparent process. As you might have seen, the interviews were live on CV. As the ANC, we are happy with the feedback we got from the public about the candidates and the process itself. There is no substance that has been raised from this side of the house, because once we talk about deployees and closeness to the ANC, I will ask you a question. Where will you get people who are not closer to the ANC? Because it's the ANC that has brought us to where we are. Where will you get people who do not have links with the African Congress? The, ANC, the DA and the EFF Austria. need to be exposed. Austria. Yes, honorable member, why are you standing? On a point of order, House Chair. What point of order are you raising, yeah, on honorable the member? The member is misleading the House Chair. On a the member is misleading the House because ANC is rejected. Thank you, honorable member. That's South not Africa. a point of order. That's the a point, point of, of debate. That Thank you very much. That's not a point of order. Take your seat. Continue, honorable member. It is very clear, Honorable Chair, that the GA and the EFF in particular are playing double standards. Because in all the engagements we have had with the interim board, they are the ones who have always been commending members of the interim board for having played a very crucial role in stabilizing the SABC. So it will be wrong to come here and suggest that the, some of the members of the interim board cannot be appointed as the ANC will always support this report. I must take this opportunity as well to expose the GA. When the GA took over in Western Cape and the city of Cape Town, the first thing that they did was to sack all top and middle officials who are not GA members. The provincial government in particular, through the premier, even went further to call all those she suspected to be ANC members and told them that they must pack and go. She even blocked their names in the system of the Western Cape government, so that even if they apply online, their CVs are rejected by the system. As the ANC, we support the report and would like to congratulate the recommended members for the challenging responsibility that they've been given. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Order, honorable members. Are there any objections to the recommendation that the committee, uh, to recommend of the committee that Ms. Phoebe Potriter Kubele, Mr. Chris Naidu, Ms. Kanyisile Kwenyama, Mr. John, John Mattison, Mr. Matata Tredu, 
Ms. Nomvuiso Baji, Ms. Rachel Kalidas, Mr. Michael Markovitz, Mr. Bongubu Samakatini, Mr. Victor Rambao, Mr. Dinkwanya Nimuhuba, and Mr. Jack Palani be recommended for appointment on South African Broadcasting Corporation Board. In light of the objection, I will put the question. Those in favor will say aye. Those against will say no. I think the eyes have it. Okay, the DA calls for division. Thank you. The division having been requested, the bells will be rung for five minutes.
Order, honorable members. I would like to remind members that they may only vote from the allocated seats. When requested to do so, members must simply indicate their vote by pressing the appropriate button below the yes, no, or abstain sides. If a member inadvertently presses the wrong button, the member may thereafter press the correct button. The last button pressed will be recorded as the member's vote when the voting session is closed by the chairperson. Order, honorable members. The question before the House is the approval of the recommendation for the appointment of Ms. Phoebe Potkiter Kubule, Mr. Krish Naidu, Ms. Kanyisile Kwenyama, Mr. John Matheson, Mr. Matata Zedu, Ms. Nomvuiso Mpaji, Ms. Rachel Kalidas, Mr. Michael Makovitz, Mr. Bongumusa Makatini, Mr. Victor Rambau, Mr. Dinkwanyani Muhuva, and Mr. Jack Palani to the board of the South African Broadcasting Cooperation. Are all members in the allocated seats? Voting will now commence. Those in favor of the recommendation should press the yes button. Those against should press the no button. Those wishing to abstain should press the abstain button. Have all members voted? Thank you. The session, the voting session is now closed. Point of order, I House Chair. House okay. Chair, yes. I see the Deputy Minister, Honorable Mkabi Siskwacha, voted with the opposition for a change. Is it a mistake by any chance? Sit down, Honorable Member. The voting session is now closed. Thank you. Honorable members, the results are as follows. Abstain, nine. The no's, 76. The yes, 194. The recommendation is duly carried. Ms. Phoebe Potkiter Kubule, Mr. Krishnaidu, Ms. Kanyisi Lekwenyama, Mr. Jo John Matheson, Mr. Matata Zedu, Ms. Nomvui Sopaji, Ms. Rachel Kalidas, Mr. Michael Makovitz, Mr. Bongumusa Makatini, Mr. Victor Rambau, Mr. Dinkwanya Nimuhuba, and Mr. Jack Palani are accordingly recommended for appointment to the Board of the South African Broadcasting Cooperation. Chairperson. Honorable Mentor. Yeah, can we, I please put it on record that the EFF does not support the name of Naidu and the name of Port Fikide. Thank you very much. We are done with that process. We continue. Can I ask the secretary to read the second to the fifth order? Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Arts and Culture on oversight visit to National Arts Council and the Song Museum of South Africa satellite sites. Consideration of the report of the Portfolio Committee on Arts and Culture on oversight visit to Performing Arts Center of Free State Anglo Boer War Order, Museum. Order, honorable members. Ben honorable African. members, can you please sit? Please, those members who are going out, do it silently, please. Continue. Consideration of the report of Portfolio Committee on Arts and Culture on oversight visit to Performing Arts of Free State Anglo Boer War Museum. Pen South African Language Board, National Library, South Africa, and the Tsong Museum of South Africa.
consideration of report of portfolio committee on arts and culture on visit to performing arts center of free state consideration of the report of portfolio committee on arts and culture on visit to nelson mandela museum thank you i will now ask the chairperson of the committee mrs honorable tom to introduce the reports siyabulela kakhulu sihlalo obekekileyo ngokunikwa elithuba lokuba sithi thaxa nengxelo phambi kwalendlu yowisomthetho ingakumbi ngale nyanga yamafa namagugu ethu nje ngale portfolio committee sathatha isigqibo kwanhlanzolo into yokuba siza ku kule minyaka mihlanu siza kujonga ngelikantsho ingakumbi kwi entity z department kuba ingxenye yemali isiwa kwezi kwezi councils ne boards kwezi entities iyo lonto sikhethe indoba siye kuzo tizakuqala nge museums ezi Nelson Mandela Museum sifike kuyo imeko imbana kuba kaloku bebe ngenayo intloko ephetheyo lo nto ke yenze ulawulo lugeqa geqe siyavuya ke ukutsho kulendlu into kuba emva koba simkile senza iziphakamiso kuyide kwaqashwa kule ke Nelson Mandela Museum zikhona izinto eziye zavela phakathi kwazo bubudlelwane nonxibelelwano phakathi kwezigqeba eziphetheyo iboards and councils kwakunye nabasebenzi sayigxininisa into kuba makubekho imvisiswano phakathi kwabo ukwenzela ba kukwazi ukusebenzeka kakhle ugrab generally recognized accounting principles uyingxaki kuzo zonke museums lo nto ke nemiphumela yakhe kuba kaloku ayikho kakhle imali yokuba yenziwe lento ifanele yenzeke kwaye emva kokuba kufunyanisiwe into kuba imali nina izinto ezikhoyo e museum kufuneka kubekho ukhuseleko oluncingqwa so sithe mayijongwe lento ngeliso elibanzi ne nokhuseleko xa kuqondwa into ba i artifact ethile imali ethile ingabiwa so ukhuseleko kwezi museums yenye yento esigxininisileyo kuzo into ba ukhuseleko malulungiswe kuba abantu ngokubaza uyazi into ba izinto ezikhoyo e museums siqabisa mali nina enye into esiqondileyo sayinonophela yindlela ekuqashwa ngayo kwi museums satsho sathi makubekho ipolisi mabenze imigomo eyenza into ba izinto zenzeke ngendlela efanelekileyo siyabulela ndayibulela kakhulu amalungu ekomiti awenza umsebenzi wawo yo awawo ngendlela encomekayo upakhofs yena simnikele kwisebe into bama liqwala sele into kaparkhofs ukuba ayiqwala seleki into kaparkhofs sizawubona ephinde lemva apho asuka khona ngenxa yendlela ekuliwa ngayo kwezi entities abantu basana enkundleni amacacha kancane nje kancane bakithi ngokukhulu ukuhloniphi honorable member are you standing on a point of order yebo okay mama what's your point of order ayi ngizwa ngokukhulu kudabuka la uyakhuluma umhlonishwa ngente balekile la nasifike sazofunga uzosebenzela abantu kodwa abantu bonke bayaphuma bahamba bebuya bezovota sathi la ke kuvalwe lama joint avulwe la parliament your major point is sikuzwile ke kuvalwe lama joint azolelana la mama ke aba wahlala phasi eh continue ma amalungu ekomiti asebenza ngendlela encomekayo awenza umsebenzi wawo engajonganga into bakuzawuthwani na 
siyabulela ndiyabulela kakhulu kumagosa asabelayo xa sithethayo kuba sitshilo thina sile committee into oba ewe indima yethu yi oversight njengoko umgaqosiseko utshoyo kodwa ke siyacebisana nalo isebe ukwenzela into oba abantu bazuze ekufaneleke bakuzuze kwisebe lobugcisa nenkcubeko kwindaba ye libraries ithi amathala encwadi sivizithele ithala lencwadi nalo labonisa indlela ugraph 103 lo sendithethi lengayo obachana ngayo idepartment sithema zidibane ziyiqoxa lento sibone ubakubekho indlela eyaphambili kuba as entities azinakusokola olhlobo ngenxa ka graph 103 owenza into oba bafumane iziphumo ezibi nakumphicothi zincwadi ndababulela kakhulu umphathiswa nesekela lakhe ngokuncedisana nathi ndiyabulela sithokoze ma eh i will now recognize so the uh, house chair I, I think the conduct of these members of Honorable the Honorable member, what's your point of order? The point of order here is Chairperson. Mm. These ANC members must account. They are now in the bar drinking. Oh, Honorable member, the that's chairs not a point are empty of order. Here. The chief it's a point of order. Thank you. No, 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 no. no Honorable they member. must account. I'm going to switch off your mic now. Uh, Honorable members. I now recognize the chief whip of the majority party. I move that uh, the reports be adopted. The motion is that the reports be adopted. Chairperson, uh, oh. the DA would like to make a declaration. Thank okay. you. Uh, we allow the declaration, DA. Honorable Speaker, honorable members, Mayor Angelo said the following. I have great respect for the past. If you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you are going, close quote. The question now is, do we know where we come from and where we are going in this department? We come from a checkered and a divided past with different cultural expressions. And this department is tasked with preserving that past for generations to come, but also to build common cultural spaces where all the different cultures can find expression towards a cohesive future. Oversight to, this, to the different entities aims to monitor whether we are achieving or succeeding in this goal. Firstly, the most serious challenge of this department remains the funding of different entities. A clear funding mod model to ensure equitous distribution of funds is not, has not been interrogated. We have found that inadequate funding has curtailed service delivering within museums and libraries specifically. Secondly, the deployed cadres of previous ministers of arts and culture continue to destabilize some entities. Peckoffs is a case in point. Clear and direct action is needed as both the board and the senior management do not sing from the same hymn book. Officials belonging to different unions hamper collective growth and and the executing of core functions in this entity. Thirdly, the dissolving of the pencil board was needed to bring to order an entity that has become a law in its own right. Honorable Minister, direct action is also needed in the Nelson Mandela Museum as the protection of valuable artifacts remains a challenge. And this challenge has been exacerbated by Grab 103. Uh, generally recognized accounting principle 103. The museums improved with specific reference to the Ditsong Museum and the anglo Boer War Museums. However, funding remains a problem, which, remains, uh, which results in many valuable assets remaining hidden in back rooms. Honorable Minister, we also have to congratulate you for finally appointing a DG after about more than three years to this department. We sincerely trust that this appointment will assist it in moving this department forward from its static position and better strategic management to steer, to steer the ship. 
we support this report. Thank you. Thank you. EFF, Babu Mbacha. Yeah, thanks, uh, House Chair. On behalf of the EFF, we reject the, the reports as presented precisely because the findings of these reports, we know very well, the majority of them will not be considered or be taken into consideration by the powers that be. We do believe, though, that these are important institutions. It could have been an amazing opportunity after the visit of the Portfolio Committee to take care and redress whatever that is a shortcoming in the majority of these institutions. These are institutions of historic nature. They have a prospect of educating our people, but if they are under a state of mismanagement and lack of direction, that is where the problem is. These institutions are of national importance for majority of the South Africans. They are a present and a future they are the custodians of what sits beneath our history, and they are custodians of what is possible for our kids to learn and be able to champion as a single nation, which is South Africa. But we believe that because there is no readiness on the side of the governing party to meet the requirements, in particular, of the struggling um, councils and institutions, we do not think the findings will actually be implemented to the latter. Despite the critical role these institutions and councils play, they are deeply and continuing to be underfunded and mismanaged. Those who are deployed by the ANC are generally incompetent and basically have no reason to be in some of these institutions. Just some of the consequences of this are the failure to bring the African languages into the mainstream of economy or into the academia, the continuation of our people not to be identified as South Africans, but to continue to be identified as racial subject together with um, further identification as ethnic groups is one of the reasons why some of these institutions, they play no role whatsoever in educating our people towards a united nation. Because these reports fail to offer any substantive recommendations that will have any meaningful change, we cannot support them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, IFP, Honorable Wurstenhazen. Or Esther Hazen. Thank you. And my apology. Continue. Thank you, through commitment with other committees, I unfortunately could not be part of this oversight visit, but would still like to raise my concerns and congratulations where appropriate. Chairperson, heritage management and cultural legislation have always existed on this continent and more so in South Africa. However, a lack of proactive measures from within heritage management, as well as external factors such as labor and management problems, as experienced by the committee, at the National Arts Council, satellite site, Anglo and Ditsong Museum, to name a few, remain a big stumbling block and are threatening the very existence of heritage in South Africa. There were three challenges prominent in this report at a committee's visit to the Free State Province. The lack of community development, the difficulty of enforcing the law, and the continuing incompetence of management and staff. This being that while there was a responsibility to develop local artists, especially in the Free State province, there was very little done in this regard. Also, appointments seem orchestrated to favor certain individuals within the structures of these institutions. The staff, in some cases, during the busiest periods, the whole staff complements were giving leave and tourists with, who traveled great distances to visit these places of historic significance were turned away. Arts and, culture not, arts and culture not only builds a nation, but can also sustain that nation against, against great arts. But then there must be commitments and the political will to oversee and identify that neglect in this important portfolio, or it could mean that the young will forget their own history. Incompetent contractors, renovations and re-renovations that are never completed results in our communities losing the privilege 
or of access to these state-owned living art centers. Positively, the DIC and the minister is committed to supporting the emerging shifts in the arts as well as protecting the existing culture and heritage sector. This will have potential to increase the growth and development of this enormously important sector, and, but only this must be put into practice. It's time for the DIC to get actively involved and to get work for the sake of the heritage of South Africa. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, NFP, Ubabu Mabika. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The National Freedom Party notes the reports of the Portfolio Committee on Arts and Culture tabled here today. The report on National Arts Council is a fine example of everything that is wrong with governance in South Africa. We have a CEO that awards herself and other executive officers salary increases without following proper procedure. Suspect performance bonuses are being paid in cash. Intimidation of staff is rife. Allegations of nepotism, the list is almost endless. Suffice to say, it is scandalous that a situation such as this should endure. And the NFP trusts that the department will take heed of the committee to make thorough investigation and stand firm on the requirements for accountability. On the other hand, the report on the the Tsonga satellites is encouraging. The observations and recommendation of the committee sent us on issues such as physical state of building and the appointment of suitable security services for the different museums. No mention is made of irregularities in governance, financial management and work condition, and we assume that these issues were found to be in order. This is in stark contrast with the observation and recommendations with regard to the Tizonga Museum itself, which is suffering from high staff turnover and general lack of organizational capacity to apply effective, transparent, and accountable governance. Overall, Chairperson, the National Freedom Party believes that these reports paint a bleak picture about governance, financial management, and general working conditions of departments and entities. It would be to the benefit of department if the observations and recommendations contained in these reports are taken seriously and acted upon with due diligence. Finally, arts and culture is recognized as a crucial component to facilitate social cohesion. And as a nation, we are in much need of some of that cohesion right now after the damage done by Bell, uh, Potinga, and the Gupta family. The devastating aftermath of this massive exercise in fostering racial tension in South Africa needs to be contained and reversed, and we believe that the department has an important role to play in this regard. In conclusion, Chairperson, the NFP supports the report. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, ANC? Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, first of all, we would like to congratulate the department and the minister for finally getting a DG. Just for the benefit of members, there are 26 entities under this uh, department. Most of them, they are ex performing exceptionally well. What you see here for those uh, like the EFF who does not attend these site visits <clears throat> or attend even portfolio meetings, is that uh, we've identified those uh, entities that are not doing so well. The whole idea is to identify the weakness so that we can strengthen the whole operation. So once you see the a bleak feature, I mean, in the, in the report, what you see there is three or four of the 26 entities that are not performing so well. But indeed, there has been an improvement. For instance, as the chair indicated, Nelson Mandela wasn't doing that well. It is doing exceptionally well. We are confident that Nelson Mandela will get a clean audit. Um, you look at uh, anglo poor war in the free state. And I wish member that, that members should visit that, that entity. 
You know that South African history and heritage had always celebrated the white members of our society. 90%, actually as we speak now, 90% of the entities of DEC celebrate white history and heritage. When in actual fact, 90% or close to 90% of the peoples of this country are black. The plan of the department and our view as a committee is that we should turn the things around. We should have entities that celebrate black, nine, constituting 90%. That's where we should go. Because what we have here is distortion. Indeed, there's a, a huge movement. There's a lot of entities that will be bringing to the fore that members will be very excited about, about the progress we are making to recognize black, Africans, Indian, colored, Koi, San, and so on and so on, which were never catered for by the government that they actually started. Well, we'll deal with your rubbish question, but Anglop War War, what was said to be Anglop War War, which is called South African War, because it excluded Africans. That's why it was saying Anglo. The minister has worked on the matter changing to African, South African War. <clears throat> A new narrative is coming out of that entity that speaks to the suffering of Africans and women, because some of them perished there, but they were never recognized. So progress is continuously being made. Indeed, uh, there is a lot that we still need to do. The song, and I wish members should visit these entities because these form part of our tourism offering to the world. It's on one of the area where our heritage is being protected. The good thing that we found there, amongst others, is that that entity has employed, it has been employing Amakesha, Amadala, Wabokoko, Nabomkulu, Babelungu, and and the reason why we need staff over ten is because finally we have a very some of Some of them are beyond the. Uh, the age that is, what they are trying to do now is to try and fast track our young females, highly educated, that have been employed there to take over and pursue the heritage and, uh, and history of our country. Pen South, it has been a very, ever since we joined the, I mean the portfolio, it has been a problem child. But we are glad today that Pen South has finally found its footing and Pen South is going to change the face of this country in terms of the language development. And we are glad those people who are busy trying to affect the progress of Pensalp, they have been spending time litigating and the courts have since explained to themselves that uh, it is time that if you litigate, you pay out of your pocket. Indeed, um, colleagues have spoken to GREP 103 and we want to appeal to government that uh, GREP 103 need to be visited. Because if GREP 103 were to be rolled out in the whole government, we are likely to collapse. It is, we don't believe as a committee that it was well thought out. We believe that it is creating more problems. It's a very good um, initiative. The biggest problem of it, it must be accompanied with millions of friends. Because our entities, our heritage sites, our museums, our libraries do not have the requisite security. So you need to beef up, actually you must have security that equals, or that is more than the content of those products. So that's a challenge that we're having. And um, you keep that yourself, tell it to, to whoever. But indeed, as I conclude, um, we are very appreciative of those of our people that are working in, in these entities, they are highly committed, they are working, well, they're working very hard, especially the board members, because most of the board members in these entities are sacrificing their time, and in terms of what they receive as appreciation for the work they do, it's very meager, but their commitment is unparalleled. And as the ANC, we already have supported the report, obviously cut it past us, and we want to appeal to the EFF to attend hearings. They must attend site visits. They must attend committees. If there are problems, 
they must present apologies. Because for them to Aus come chair. here and can stand, that uh, these things will not be implemented. The member is misleading you don't the even house know where and they are. the people of South Africa. We are attending the Honorable committee. Member we are attending the oversight. Honorable member. You must stop lying. Thank you. Oh. Honorable member, no. You cannot say a member is lying. Can you withdraw that? Can you withdraw that, Honorable Mashabela? Just the, the, the last part of your statement. Okay, he's misleading the house. Thank you, sit down, uh, honorable you. member. I want to appeal to please. members of the EFF to please, they get paid by the state. They get paid by public pass. They must attend site visits. They must attend site visits. EFF Point of order. members Point of must order. attend order, order, site chair. visits. Point of order. order chair. Chair. The, I think Umama was the first one to, to call the point yeah. of order. Ma'am. We are as lent I show you, Tonish, and Gabong, I'm Tonish of Yaz Wooty. John Obabasi, Lassi, Cocano, and Manzaba. Utiling a Labantaba, the Cabasa, Chuiki, Abacotano, and Abacotano, and Abacotano. What's your well, point of order? Thank well, you very the, much. If there is a dispute, we have very simple mechanisms in Parliament. We have minutes. It can be subjected to a party, party political uh, uh, committee to relook at what I've said. If it's I'm telling lies, but indeed it's the truth. Thank the you others very have much. confessed. Your time has expired, said, honourable member. I did not attend. Which is thank honest. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, honourable members. The motion is that the reports be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections. Agreed to. Uh,